the protagonist's death came suddenly. He had no idea where it would hit him. He could remember his boss from his part-time job, remembered college, and how he didn't turn in his report. Even the faces of the kids at the orphanage that made it seem like the hero's life wasn't so bad. So if he had a choice, he would choose to stay alive. With a sharp scream, the boy woke up in the middle of the forest. Opening his eyes, he saw a clear night sky. Taking his time, the hero slowly got up and walked to a tree. Leaning against it, he grabbed himself by the clothes on his chest. The guy immediately thought that this was the outside world. The river Styx was not visible here, nor was the flower garden. No sign of the old world at all. His stomach rumbled, and he realized how hungry he was. The first thing that came to mind was to eat the leaf he had in his hand. After chewing, he immediately spit it out. He thought about how bad it was that he was eating such a thing. The hero assumed that this time he would probably starve to death, but decided to look for something. Turning to another tree, he saw a large centipede and thought to himself that it didn't look so bad, especially if you imagine it fried and spiced. Taking the rock in his hands, the guy thought it was still better than sitting around hungry. Tasting the scalopendra, the guy thought about how disgusting it was, but it was better than nothing. Walking to the river, he decided to rinse his face, remembering the time he was hit by a truck. There was no way he'd be alive after that. He looked carefully at his reflection in the water. The reflection was a completely different face, and it took the hero a while to realize that he had been reborn into a different person. Not believing it, he rinsed his face once more. He thought about the fact that every other manga was about this at this point. That meant he had been reborn in another world. Or had he possibly been sent here by someone? Falling on his back, the guy exhaled thoughtfully and heavily. He thought about falling asleep and waking up in the hospital, hoping that the truck hadn't hit him too hard. The full moon was shining in the sky. Without thinking, the hero knelt down and thought that nothing like this would happen. Everything was in place, and he needed to think about how to survive. The first thing to do was to figure out where he was. It was unlikely he would ever make it to Japan, so he decided to move on. He thought it would be a good idea to find people and look for food first. As he walked through the forest and looked up, he thought about how empty the jungle was. The hero decided it was worth looking for insects. Ducking into the bushes, he heard a voice calling him. Rejoicing, the guy thought he had finally met a human. He was about to introduce himself when he was speechless. In front of him stood a large beast with the head of an eagle. Its body was like a huge wolf and it had wings on the sides. Barely getting the words out of his mouth, the hero said that he was lost, but the beast said that this was his territory and ordered the guy to get out of here. The hero waved his arms in terror, begging the eagle not to eat him. He said that it had little meat and only bones, assuring him that it was not nutritious at all. After all, he had just been reborn and he didn't want to die. The beast told him that he didn't eat crap, much less him. He asked the guy what the guy thought he was. The hero was even more frightened and said that he didn't mean to offend him, so he was leaving now. Running away with all his legs, the hero thought about what is going on here. In his head were thoughts of the fact that he was sent here in this world, on an empty stomach, so even moved into another body. He had to eat a scalopendra, and after that a griffin. What kind of world is this? The guy thought that he should get out of here quickly, as at that moment he was blocked by the same griffin. He shouted furiously to the hero to get out of his territory. He said that all this jungle belonged to him by treaty and asked how dare he look for food on his territory. The hero apologized and said he got lost. He had no idea whose land this was, but the griffin cried out that the guy was a liar. The treaty between humans and the griffin has been in place for 200 years, and even babies know about it. The lad thought about the fact that he might be right. But there's more to it than that. He demanded an explanation from the hero. And if the reason was good, he would let him live. The hero thought in horror that he was finished. All he could do was tell the truth, but would the griffin believe him? The guy knelt down and guiltily said that it wasn't really his body, but the beast didn't understand. The hero thought about the fact that now he is definitely finished. He bowed to the very ground, saying with desperation that he didn't know why he was here and he didn't know anything about these lands. He begged to believe him. Upon reflection, the griffin assumed he was a wanderer. If that was the case, then he should have apologized, 
as the hero really knew nothing about these places. The hero didn't know what he meant, but the griffin called it a misfortune if he had wandered this far. The beast told the guy that he would have to learn about this world, and even if he hated fate, nothing would change anymore anyway. The hero asked in surprise what kind of wanderers he was talking about. The griffon meant of course people from other worlds, but the guy asked about the fact that wasn't he born here. The hero told the griffin his whole story. After listening, the beast said that he knew nothing about it, and that he had met a similar traveler 500 years ago, but he was different. And yet he was a wanderer, a reborn man. Griffon asked him what the guy meant when he said he was a child. Had he really been an adult? The hero said he used to be an adult, but now he was just a child, and asked the griffin if that was a bad thing. The beast faintly smiled and told him that in that case he would let him go, but on one condition. The hero had to do him one favor. When he came with the griffin to a cave in the middle of the forest, the boy saw the people and asked him who they were. The griffin answered him that they were children like him. There were boys and girls as well as small children. Uncomprehending, the guy asked why there were so many children here. Griffon didn't know, since they were abandoned in his forest. The guy thought of being very hungry, assuming that he was abandoned just for lack of food. The hero assumed that the griffin wanted to ask to take care of them, and the beast said that the lad was a quick thinker. He asked to keep an eye on them until they could take care of themselves. Not that the hero didn't like the children, since he himself had grown up in an orphanage. He asked the griffin about food. The griffon said he would help with getting food, but the hero has three years to train the people to get their own food. This was a surprise to him. The hero thought to himself that the beast was kind after all. He thought rather that he would get angry and tell them to get their own food by eating insects. The hero asked the griffin why he was so protective of children. He only asked him to think about the fact that who in their right mind would abandon starving children. He asked the hero if he could forget them in that case. After all, they were responsible for those they had protected, and that was the end of the matter. The hero noticed that the beast had already brought fruit into the cave. Humans and griffins are quite different and the reason was most likely because he didn't know how to raise a human. The hero said he would look after them, and the griffin called it a wise choice. He smiled at the humans, but they didn't seem too pleased with his presence. The boy waved to them, and said he was their new leader. He was happy to meet them, but the kids started to discuss something among themselves. Listening, the boy was shocked, because the people were talking in a different language. Griffon leaned over to him and said that he forgot to mention it. People from another world don't understand the language here. The hero was curious. Why then does he understand the griffin? The beast called it a blessing of the sacred dialect. It was all due to nature. The blessing facilitated communication with other races. The hero wondered, and the griffin decided to lend him the blessing. The hero was surprised, and the beast said that this is normally impossible. However, he is just as blessed by generosity. He spoke of the blessing of bounty, it allowed one to bestow his boons on others. The hero was concerned. What about the griffin itself? The griffon said he would just lend him the blessings of the tongue, but not give it to him. A blessing of the tongue turns what is heard and spoken into a different dialect. There is a limit to the number of tongues. The blessing sounds like a sacred power from fantasy books. The hero asked how many blessings the griffin had in total, to which the griffin replied that it had 12 blessings. The hero was shocked. He thought about the fact that the local was so trivial, or was it all because the one was a griffin? The beast replied to the guy that in truth there was not much of value, such as the blessing of the tongue was useless to him, and suggested the guy to say something to them. The hero without even thinking about it replied in the language of the people that he was glad to meet them. After saying this, he was surprised because he said it in another language. The girl said she was glad to meet him and introduced herself as Oni-chan. The hero was over the moon, he understood them. The guy who was standing next to the girl unkindly asked the hero what his name was. The hero smilingly asked, isn't it customary to introduce oneself first and then ask the other person's name? The nervous guy replied that his name was Ron, and after saying that he had named himself, impatiently demanded the hero to give his name. The hero hesitated, he whispered to the griffin, and said that he needed to think of a name so that he wouldn't be different from them. The beast suggested the name Almus. The hero asked him the meaning of the name, but the griffin did not know. 
and suggested that the main thing was the sound. This was settled, and the boy said his name was Almas. Ron asked how old he was, but when the hero said he was 20, the guy didn't believe him. He told the hero that the guy looked younger than him. Griffon noticed that the guy wasn't lying, he was. The men were puzzled by his words. Almas, without paying attention, offered to introduce himself to the others. Ron was 12 years old. The girl next to him, Sion, said she was Ron's childhood friend. The boy next to him called himself Rose Wood. He was 11. The hero looked at the girl who sat farthest away. It was Tatra. She was 10. The other was named Graham. She was also 10 years old. They were picked up by a girl named Lulu, who was also 10. The hero noticed that all the children here were over the age of 9. Ron shouted that he refused to recognize him as the leader, even though he introduced himself. The hero smiled, thinking that he could understand him. From the looks of it, he's a kid who just came here and called himself in charge. However, it was just like the orphanage that the hero immediately remembered. Xi'an apologized for Ron and said that it wasn't out of malice. She called him just a bit stupid. Ron got angry and asked her why he was stupid. An argument ensued, with the kids arguing and yelling typical childish excuses. He who calls his own name is called that. The hero looked at them and realized that they were just abandoned children. But despite this, they were cheerful. But inside, they were all suffering, and the hero thought about how he had a duty to protect them. Tatra looked at him questioningly. Ron, as if trying to press the hero, asked if their new leader had any ideas and asked him to tell them. Almas smiled and said they would farm the land. Ron was outraged, but the hero said they had no choice but to farm. He told the children that the griffin would only support them for three years, so all 34 children would have to be able to support themselves. Ron exclaimed that it was hard and asked how they could do that. The hero thought to himself that it certainly won't be easy they are in the deepest part of the forest where there were too many trees. They had to cut down some of them. First uprooting them, after that the soil would be softer and become suitable for farming. But there was one unsolved problem. Their team consisted of only children. How many of them would be able to hold a hoe? Rose said it was hopeless, and looking for encouragement asked Tetra if that was true. There was nothing easy about it. The girl thought about the fact that there was no other way. Siona asked the hero, so what is farming? Almas told the children that they should have gotten metal tools for farming. Once they had them, things would be much easier. Ron asked what they should do, and the hero offered to trade. Ron told him that all the valuables had been eaten by the children. Almas smiled, but he was upset, since those things weren't edible. He assumed that they must have had a couple of valuables left. A griffin came up behind them with a sack, and apologized for the weight. The hero was glad, and said they would find a use for the items, thinking it was something for agriculture. The kids were surprised when they saw the pile of swords. The hero thought to himself that these were the swords of all those who wanted to challenge the griffon, but why were there so many of them? The griffon said that these things were scattered around his forest, and he was annoyed by it. He was glad to be rid of them, and asked for a little more time to bring the rest. Tetra picked up the sword and assumed that the hero wanted to trade them for farming tools. Almas was surprised and pleased with Thetra and asked if he could stroke her head. But the Thetra brushed him off sharply, startling Almas. Ron suggested that it would be better to exchange them for food. Tatra gave him a disdainful look and asked what they would do after they ran out of food. Chew grass. She said all they needed to do was plow the ground. The hero told them to start by finding soft soil. If they can't find it, they will have to hire laborers. He also said that if they used swords as payment, they would have less chance of running into the bad guys. In case something happened, the griffin would deal with them. The only problem was, where could they trade the swords? Were there any experts in the field? Ron and the others said they didn't know anything. Wood smugly said he'd rather die than tell him. But the hero realized he didn't know anything either. He looked at Tetra. Briefly and clearly, she said what she knew. This is the forest of Romalia, the kingdom of Rosicrucian to the east. To the northwest is the kingdom of Gilbd. To the northeast is the kingdom of Damarga. The kingdom of Thaldarm lies to the north. Rosix is bad at making metal things. Damarga and Gilbd take advantage of the famine and attack Thaldarm. 
this was their chance, as it's a pretty valuable weapon that can be sold for a great price. The hero asked her how she knew all this. Tatra said that they are adults, and they are capable of stealing their weapons. Almas asked them not to worry, and said that he had already thought of everything. In that case, they needed to use the griffin feather. The children were surprised when Almas showed them the feather. They would show them that they were following the griffin sama's instructions, so they would definitely be able to negotiate everything. The hero said that they didn't have to go all at once, and only needed a couple volunteers. He smiled at Tatra, and said that she was the expert and the smartest one here. He had already decided, and took the girl's hand and said she would go with them. But she didn't raise her hand. She must have been upset by the choice. There were a lot of people on the grounds of Damagers. It was quite a built-up city with a variety of people working there. The hero approached the vendor and offered him 10 steel swords and 6 bronze swords, asking if they could exchange them. The old man took the sword in his hands and looked around. He asked the boys if they were the messengers of the Griffin Sama. Two men came up from behind and told the seller that the blacksmith had arrived. After inspecting the swords with the blacksmith, the seller turned to the children and smiled. He said the swords were excellent and asked what they would like to trade for. They asked for ten iron hoes, three axes, and eight sickles. Ron was shining with joy. They had exchanged these swords and received so much. All of their weapons were made of metal, and it was very valuable. Xian said that it was too little and should have been sold for a higher price. But Almas answered her that they were only middlemen, and it was better to start with low prices. He thought about whether he could let these kids plow. Relying on his mediocre knowledge, farming alone wouldn't be enough. They have to start hunting, harvesting, and fishing. On top of that, they have a griffin that provided them with meat and leather to sell. The lad pondered on where they should start and where they could farm. Almost thought about whether they could just cut down the trees. Or would the griffon be mad at them? When they got to the forest, Almas met with the griffon and told his plan, asking what the griffon thought of it. The griffon replied that the plan was good and that his territory was deep in the forest and that outside of it they could do whatever they wanted. He also remembered that 30 years ago there had been people living here, but the place had been abandoned because of the pandemic. The people thought of the griffin cursing these lands. The hero asked him why he hadn't told them before, and asked him to show him the place. The griffon said it was a long time ago, and he doesn't remember exactly. He ordered the lad to climb it, and look down from the heights. As he flew up into the sky, the guy got scared and said they could give up on it, and the griffon asked him not to touch it anywhere. Almas asked what if he needed to go to the bathroom, to which the griffon said he would just throw him off. He noticed one place and said it seemed to be there. They flew to an abandoned settlement. It was quite large, but all abandoned, all the houses were destroyed. The griffon landed in the middle of the village. Standing up against the wall, the hero tried hard to catch his breath out of fear. The griffon told him that anything regarding reclamation would be more convenient to take advantage of what they already had rather than trying to remake something. Taking a breath, Almas asked looking around. He saw ruined houses with a small river flowing nearby. Leaning over, he saw that the water was crystal clear and seemed to be drinkable. The hero thought about whether they could live in these houses. Going into one of the houses, he took a chair and stood on it. Looking at the roof, he thought that if they could fix it, they could stay here temporarily. Walking out of the house, on the other side, he noticed a field on the other side that led to a forest. As he thought, the fields were overgrown with grass, but they could still use it for grazing. The width of the field mattered. The hero was glad it was better here than he thought. The griffon only said there was no problem with that. After all, it wasn't all created by him anyway. The hero asked him to tell him about the disaster and the famine, and why it all started. The griffon told him that it all started because of a bad harvest. The griffon said that such a thing could be done by man, suggesting that it was spoilage. The hero didn't know what he meant, and the griffon was surprised that the guy was reacting that way. Almas asked if the griffon had any proof for that assumption. The hero thought that the griffon had told him about this world being protected, and of course they could have powerful magic like curses and spoils. The griffon replied to him that his words were the proof, for what is obvious is that men are creatures who love to kill. He doubted that there were any other creatures who loved to kill each other so much. 
almost suggested that if it was as he said, in that case they couldn't survive here if it happened again. The Griffon asked him not to worry, for he would not allow this forest to be touched. Besides, this is the type of curse that can't be used instantly. Almus understood him and said he would call the children. Griffon asked him to do it tomorrow, for the sun was already setting over the horizon. Turning to the boy, he told him to get on his back. Thinking of this, Almus snickered and they flew back together. The next day, all the children, led by Almus, reached the village, where the boy excitedly said that this was their new home. Everyone was thrilled and started looking around. Ron grudgingly asked the hero what they should do next in that case. He also clenched his teeth and said something about not recognizing Almus as the leader yet. Sion asked him to be more honest already. After provoking the guy, Sion wanted to run away as Ron ran after her. Tathra approached Almus and said that before he showed up, they were just a bunch of kids. All ideas were dismissed, there was no plan. Kids always missed their parents, and Ron and Rosewood started arguing. After that, everything changed. The hero said he was just like her. Ron turned to the leader and asked what would he teach them. Almus smiled and said they would do crop rotation. The children looked at the hero with incomprehension. Ron said with joy in his eyes that crops sounded delicious. Siona noticed that Ron had nothing on his mind but food. They will be able to grow barley, clover, wheat. They will change it all every four years. Ron asked why make it so complicated. To which the hero replied that it's hard to grow anything on soil that doesn't contain nutrients. Clover effectively fertilizes the soil, so they will be able to cultivate it all year round. Also, when they raise cattle, they can collect their manure and use it as fertilizer. The soil and the cattle constantly support each other. This is what is called crop rotation. It sounded like it was magic, but it wasn't. There were disadvantages. For example, dividing a field into four parts reduces the yield by two or even three times. Raising cattle was a profitable endeavor, and they should have them to begin with. Rose didn't understand what the hero was saying. Almas said that, in short, crop rotation was more productive, and that was all he needed to know. The very first thing they needed to do was fix the houses. Everyone got to work. Some fixed the roof and passed boards to each other. Others brought other materials. The girls were tearing up the grass and putting things in order. Tatra approached Almas, asking him what he planned to do with the place. The boy said he was going to raise goats in the structure. Goats aren't gourmets and eat only tree bark so even kids could raise them, even though they can't be put to work. Actually, Almas said that he plans to raise cows and horses as well, but he doesn't know how to take care of them. They could use them not only as a source of meat, but also for labor. At the orphanage, he somehow had experience raising goats, the orphanage had a farm, and they helped raise their livestock, in return getting food from them. The girl said she didn't really understand it and asked if that was all they needed. She thought it would all be a problem. Almas told her that goat's milk didn't taste very good, but it was very nutritious. The food the griffin gave them didn't contain calcium. An unbalanced diet could lead to serious illnesses in the future. Thatra sighed heavily. She smiled. The girl knew he was worried about them. Siona was worried about how they would be agreed to trade cattle, especially during a famine. Tatra had told her that the Rosin Kingdom was in urgent need of weapons right now and they would have to agree. The hero thought about the fact that they were far away, and they should ask the griffin for help. If it still fails, the transportation of the goats would be on him. The griffon shouted furiously to the goats, and warned them that if they ran away, he would kill them, asking them to be good boys. Almas told the seller that this was their griffin himself, and he could speak goat. The vendor noticed that the griffin spoke cruelly to them. Upon arriving at the village, the children began to play with a herd of goats. The hero showed the children a bow, and said that while he was trading for goats, he noticed some bows with arrows that would suit them. They would be good for hunting, so he took them too. As he aimed the bow and arrow at the target, the boy missed. Ron was overjoyed, and shouted that the leader had missed for the tenth time in a row. The hero told him to shut up, and handing him the bow, asked him to demonstrate. Ron picked up the weapon and an arrow flew out of his bow and fell. Almas laughed and said that even Ron couldn't do that. The hero grabbed him by the shoulder and asked him how they would hunt in that case, and what would they do about it? 
Ron was even more hurt by this and asked him to stop making these sarcastic remarks like a little kid. The hero noticed the fact that he was indeed a child. But Ron asked him to act a little more mature in that case. The children shouted to the leader and suggested that he try Gren. The hero didn't really believe in success, since even Ron couldn't do it. He thought about the problem with the bow itself. It must be made in China. At that moment, the arrow flew into the target. The arrow pierced the target almost in the center, and everyone was amazed. It turned out that Grem knew how to shoot, and it was amazing. Siona excitedly asked her to do it again. The girl took aim, and then the arrow hit the target again. Almost enthusiastically said she hit it twice, and Ron picked up on it and said that it couldn't have been just luck. The boys on either side of her asked her to teach them to shoot the same way. The girl started the lesson by asking them to straighten their backs first. The hero put his hands on Grimm's shoulders and told her that the griffin would not be providing them with food in three years, so the hunt would fall on her shoulders. He asked her to give her best effort. After all, no one but Grimm could hit the bullseye. Ron asked the leader if it was okay for the girl to hunt alone. Besides, they only have one bow. The boy asked not to worry about that and said that he had thought of everything. He offered to check something else first, giving a piece of cloth to Sione. Alma said it was a slingshot that could be used to throw stones. He showed how to use it. You hold the end of the first string with one hand, then put the stone inside, and hold the other end of the string with the remaining hand. Then one had to unwind at high speed. After waiting for the right moment, one just had to let go of the shoelace. After explaining, he let out a stone that hit the wooden target and partially shattered it. Everyone was surprised. If they tried hard enough, they could shoot down birds. Moreover, it was easy to do since there were rocks lying everywhere. To start, Almus offered to give everyone the device. After inspecting the vegetation, the griffin also showed Almus which leaves could be eaten and which ones could make their stomachs sick. But if they soaked them in water, they would wash away all the poison. Almus asked the griffin if it was true that he could eat more than just meat. The griffin said that he also sometimes wants to eat vegetables. He is half bird and also half beast. It was strange to see a bird eating meat. After all, was the griffon a bird or a mammal? The hero asked the griffin about the mushroom he found. The griffon said he could eat it, but for him, a human, it was certain death. Alma smiled and thanked the griffin for everything. The griffon yawned and said he was feeling sleepy, deciding to fly back home. The guy waved goodbye to him. The guy thought about the fact that now it was time for him to go home too. Farming, butter, hunting animals, all of these things are vital, but harvesting is important too. Harvesting is pretty easy for children. It would be nice if the griffon could teach them how to distinguish edible food from inedible food. The hero went back home. Almas heard something in the forest, thinking it was Rose's voice. Making sure he had his weapon on him, he ran to help. If it was a small animal, he could hit it and drive it away. But if it was something big, he would have to find a way to save Rosewood. The boy hoped he was okay. Looking out from behind the bushes, the hero saw the guy being held by a bald man. Calling Rose a brat, he ordered him to hold still. The boy asked him to let him go, because he was useless to him, and his parents had abandoned him. Rosewood yelled to the man that he wouldn't be able to trade him for food. Knowing this, the man said he had many steel swords. The hero overheard them and realized that he wanted to take their swords. The hero thought about the fact that the man in front of him was a grown man who was stronger than him, but he was also an ordinary man. The hero assessed Rosewood's condition, thinking that he was fine. He decided that the man was vulnerable from the back, and he needed to act quickly. Grabbing a rock in his hands, Almas swung it at the man. With all his might, the stone hit him right in the head. The man cried out in pain and his nose bled. After freeing the guy for a moment, Alma shouted to Rosewood to run. After recovering a bit from the blow, the man shouted to the hero to stand where he was standing. Rosewood stopped and looked fearfully at the hero, but Alma yelled at him to run away quickly. He was going to stop the man himself. Rosenwood wanted to resist, but still ran to the village. The bald man noticed that Almas was holding him up for the other to escape. Clutching his head with his hand in pain, the man noticed a stick that looked more like a club. Taking it in his hands, he asked the boy not to cry, and asked him if he wasn't a little kid. 
The hero decided to ask him a question about what he was trying to accomplish. To which the man replied that he wanted steel swords. But what happens then? The man confidently said he would trade them for food, since he didn't like farming. Alma said that in that case he would relieve him of that, and pulling his sword from its sheath, shouted to the man that he was an idiot. Striking the stick with his sword, he broke it in two. The man didn't realize what had happened, and while he was in shock, the hero grabbed him by the scruff of the neck, and dropping him to the ground swung his sword to strike. The man begged him to wait, but it was as if Almas didn't hear him. He drove his sword right into the stranger's chest, and begged him to die sooner. The man's arms fell dead. The hero thought about the fact that if he had let them get robbed today, he wouldn't have stopped there. If the villagers heard about it, more like him would come. Looking at his bloodied hands, Almas grasped his face in horror and remembered his words from earlier. Realizing what he had done, nausea surged up to him. Getting off the man, he vomited on the spot. At that moment, the guys were already running to him, asking him if he was alright. Coming to his senses, Almas remained silent as everyone looked at the man's corpse. Rosewood leaned over Almas worriedly, and calling him brother asked if he was alright. The hero told them everything was fine. Tears welled up in Rosewood's eyes, but the boy smiled back at him gravely. After saying that everything was fine, he apologized for making him worry. Rosewood exclaimed that he was afraid he was going to die, because it would have been his fault. But the hero patted him on the head, and apologizing said he wasn't used to that. The boys talked to each other for a while, and then went home. Almas told the vulture about everything, and he asked him not to worry about it. After all, not only humans kill each other, even ants do it. He asked him to just imagine the guy did it for food and that there was nothing wrong with it. The hero understood what the vulture meant, but he had a hard time dealing with such a large train of thought. The griff agreed that it was hard for social creatures to bear killing their own kind. But be that as it may, it was his job to protect the children. Getting them back to the colony was also his responsibility. Griff assumed that was it, and the kid should go back. But the hero handed him the broad stick that the bald man was holding and asked him to take a look. Almas then clenched his hands, causing the stick to shatter into planks. Griff didn't understand anything, but wasn't that strange? A ten-year-old kid with that kind of strength. The kid knew a race of people who could break trees in half with their bare hands, and they were definitely not human. The griff calmed him down and told him that this race had left the place 300 years ago. Almas exhaled and said they were lucky. Griff assumed the guy wanted to surprise him with his power, but Almas asked Griff what kind of power was that. He didn't understand why he suddenly possessed such power. The Griff couldn't know about the guy's body, and if he understood correctly, it could have been a blessing. After all, he was a wanderer. Perhaps young Seng took a liking to him and sent him here. It wouldn't be surprising if he had one or two blessings. Almas asked who he meant, and the Griff said he'd rather not know. Turning away from the boy, he asked if that was it. Confused, the hero said he had learned a lot of information, and he needed to think about everything in private. Half a month later, the children were laboring in the vegetable garden. Almas was pleased, for they had managed to exchange for radish seeds. Even more fortunate in that it was no different from the radishes in his world. It was a pity that they didn't have many workers, so the scale of production wasn't large. Growing radishes has been going well so far. But the insects were spoiling everything, they were scaring the children. Ron nervously asked what they should do about them. Looking at the neighboring bushes, he was horrified by the number of insects. They didn't have any chemicals to repel the insects. Living deep in the forest also had its disadvantages. The boy tiredly took a daisy in his hands and asked the children to look at it. With daisies, they could get rid of pests. They are usually called pyrethrum. He found a whole field of daisies. They will recycle them and pour them on the field to get rid of the pests. Tatra excitedly said that was a good idea. The children gathered for the daisies. While picking flowers, Almas held out a bouquet of daisies to Thetra. The girl was confused and cried out, Why is this all of a sudden? Siona smiled at Tatra and whispered in her ear that Almas just wanted her to help him hold the bouquet. Nervously pulling the bouquet out of her hands, the disgruntled girl said she understood that. While the hero was throwing the daisies into the boiling water, he talked about the distillation process that was going on. 
The children wondered if it would be effective, but Almas couldn't know for sure. Ron wondered why the pests would even die when they used it, assuming it was some sort of spoilage. The boy explained that it was poison for the insects. The kids got excited, but he assured them that it doesn't work on humans. However, if they used it in large quantities, he didn't know if it would work. When everything was ready, Almas suggested watering all the fields, and the children set to work. After the work, all they had to do was keep an eye on the field. At this point, necessities like food and shelter were enough for them. Now they needed to buy what they had in short supply. The hero said that at the time when they needed to leave this place, someone should protect everyone, and that role should be taken by Graham. The girl was surprised, but Alma said that she was the one who could use arrows and shoot a bow. Isn't she the right person for that? Ron and Rosewood would carry the things. Turning to Tatra, the hero asked if she would go with them. But hearing about the Rosicrucian kingdom, she refused. The boys reached the capital city of Rosicrucian. They were amazed at how crowded it was. The hero smiled and thought that he had not seen so many people for a long time. This city was more beautiful than he had expected. Ron shouted to the leader that there was food, and looked at the counter where the cooks were stirring brews. The hero noticed that it smelled very good. At that moment Rosewood grabbed him by the shoulder and pulled him to the place where they were selling clothes. They noticed that there was a man there, and Rosewood took the leader by the arm and offered to look. The guy asked the two of them to calm down, it was okay to get excited, but dragging the older man by the arm was a little off-putting. First they had to find a place to exchange money, because without money they couldn't buy anything. After looking around, the guy walked up to a shop and asked the man where here they could exchange animal teeth and grass for money. They were shown the way, and the trio made their way to the shop. They took out the animal teeth, and the man handed them a couple of pennies. Upset, the hero asked if he could give them more. The man offered only a roll of Batiste in return. Almas decided that this would be enough and got some grass. Suddenly a certain girl exclaimed that it was caramel grass. The guy didn't understand what she meant. The old man seller recognized the girl and smiled at her. It was Yuria herself. The girl turned to Almas and asked what his name was. The hero introduced himself and she asked him to give the herb to her. Not for free, of course. The hero thought about the fact that the seller got along well with her, anticipating that it would be a good deal. Reluctantly, he offered one gold coin, and the girl didn't take long to agree. The hero wondered what she wanted it for. Yuria smiled and said that by mixing it with marijuana, she would get an amazing drug. The guy cringed a little and thought about how her parents were watching her. She turned to Almas Kuhn, but he porpoised to just call him Almas. The girl smiled and asked to address her the same way, since they were the same age. She turned to Ron and Rosewood, asking who they were. The children thought of Yuria looking like a rich kid. Nervously, they introduced themselves. The girl asked where they were from, and Almas said they were from a village one way from here. Yuria asked if Romelia was near the forest. She said that this caramel grass was very valuable, and asked him to show her where he got so much of it. Smiling, the hero asked what he would get in return, and the girl laughed saying he had the right idea. She offered them a deal. Every month he would bring her caramel grass, and she would pay him one gold coin. Almas agreed, and she suggested that from now on they exchange at this spot every month. After shaking hands, they made a deal. Yuria said that in that case, she should go or her father would scold her. Abruptly, she pulled the hero's hand towards her, and being close to his face, Yuria whispered to him that he had one good blessing. Smiling, she waved goodbye, asking him not to forget the deal. The hero was shocked that she mentioned the blessing. In the house, Vatra taught the hero their language without a blessing. She asked him to wish good morning in their language. After pronouncing the words, she sternly told him that he was mispronouncing it and asked him to repeat it again. He only managed to communicate with the children because the griffin herself lent him a divine blessing. However, when you reciprocate something, you have to give it back someday. If he couldn't communicate with them, it would be hard for him. He asked Thetra to ask him something. He asked her to tell him everything she knew about the world. The girl was surprised, but then told him that they were on the Adelia Peninsula. About half of the island is the kingdom of Roselle, the peak pointing to the ocean is the south of Kirisha. 
She also mentioned that On herself was half Carisian and Adelian. She could speak Carisian as well. The hero was thrilled, because knowing two languages is great. In any case, Rosicrucian is not controlled that much. The Kingdom of Rossix and the Kingdom of Domorgul have the same name, but that doesn't mean anything but a kind of political cooperation between the two kingdoms. Almas asked Tetra if she could write, and she of course said yes. The hero asked her that after he learned the language, she would teach him how to write. The girl said that Adelia did not have any writing system. Looking at the writing on the parchment, the boy assumed she wrote in Syrian. Tetra agreed, and Almas asked her, after he learned Adelian, to teach him Syrian as well. The girl was embarrassed and agreed to help him. The hero noticed that she was helping him a lot, and thought of giving her something in return. He asked the girl how many times she could count to, and asked her how about calculus, adding and subtracting from two digits. He promised to show her something tomorrow. After giving the children a semblance of school, Almas smiled and told them that there would be extra classes today. Lulu approached the hero and he asked her what was up. She asked if it would be of any use to them. All the kids were just as unhappy. Almas remarked that it was a good question and said that if they didn't know how to count and exchange materials for money, they would be easily cheated by merchants. Therefore they had to know how to calculate and asked Ron and Rosewood if that was the case. Those confirmed it. Siona assumed that the two of them had done something, and Ron confessed that when they bought different things, they were fooled into not giving change. If they know how to calculate, they could even open their own store, and then there would be more options for their future. Almas asked Thetra to count to ten. The girl started counting, and the guy said she missed zero. They are lucky that this world uses a base of ten numbers, but they don't know about zero. Zero meant nothing. After all, Almas had taught them Arabic numerals. Arabic numerals are convenient, and they are one of the top 10 human innovations. However, only Thetra could write up to 10,000, and that was annoying. She was unhappy that it was complicated, and the hero told her that if she got used to it, she would be interested. Back at the house, Almas was giving Tatra extra lessons. The girl sat right on the hero's lap, saying she had answered all the questions. It's been a month since he started giving extra classes. And looking at their rankings, all those with high rankings had to teach those with low rankings. After all, Tetra was number one and had to teach everyone. She was not happy about this and said that if she were to teach others without any benefit, it would not be fair. She wanted to be taught algebra first. After all, she had already taught Almas Adelian and Syrishan, and if she wasn't getting any benefit, it wasn't fair. As a result, Almas gave Tatra a special perk. The hero praised her and said that she did the right thing. She could now subtract and add three digit numbers. He said they would now move on to multiplication. The girl asked Almas if everyone in his house knew how to calculate. The hero said that even children younger than Tatra knew how to calculate, but she was better than them because she had been learning Arabic numerals from the beginning. She turned to him, still sitting on his lap, and asked her if he was praising her now. The hero smiled and stroked her hair. The girl asked why they were all able to learn it. And Alma said that in their country, learning is a duty. Education is a boon to every citizen, knowledge is gold, thinking that they should keep it for themselves. It's okay for high school students, but if they want to keep the knowledge for themselves, then the country won't be able to develop and compete with other countries. Didn't she want to raise kids as smart as her? She agreed that it was difficult. Tatra asked Almas when he would be fluent in their languages by now. But the hero said it's very difficult, and maybe she doesn't even know about it. She asked what if one day, he loses his blessing. And Almas said that in that case, he wouldn't be able to teach her math. Tatra said then he can't lose it. A month later, the hero met with Yuria and handed her the caramel weed as they had agreed. Handing over the coin, she asked the guy where his friends Ron and Rosewood were, but Almas said they stayed home. He told Yuria that he wanted to talk to her. The girl immediately thought of the blessing and didn't mind talking about it, making the hero surprised. She guessed that her knowledge of his blessing had kept him busy for a month. The hero replied that if possible he would like to know more about it. Yuria didn't know much herself, but the book said that blessings were bestowed by good fairies. The hero only hesitated and said that fairies are some kind of fairy tales. 
That's why the girl said he was blessed. Yuri's blessing allowed him to see the blessing of others. It's called clairvoyance. And as far as she understood, his blessing is called emperor. It was that as more people followed him, the more powerful his abilities became. The hero thought of the children that most likely accepted him as a leader, so he had abilities. Yuria confirmed this and asked permission to ask something. She mentioned that they lived in the Romalian forest, in the Griffon's territory, and asked if they were afraid of his curse. Alma sullenly asked her how she knew. Yuria could see what was happening no matter the distance. This blessing is called the Eye of a God. She saw the way she and her friends entered the forest and thought they lived there. She asked to tell her how they avoided the curse. The hero told her that there was no curse. He thought that nothing terrible would happen if he told her, but naturally accept reincarnation. The girl said in all seriousness that they were abandoned children and promised to keep the secret secret. The hero was happy about it and thanked her. Yuria offered the guy to go for a walk. She still needed to buy something and Almas agreed because she is their special client. After a while, Almas was shocked by Yuria. Dragging everything she bought after her, he was shocked at how much she needed. She ran up to literally every shop and took something. Yuria asked the guy not to be a nuisance, but the hero replied that he was not her porter, much less a nuisance. The hero frowned and asked what she needed all those stones and herbs for, and the girl replied that she needed them for the evil eye. The boy did not understand her and she said that she was a witch. The hero guessed she was talking about that creepy magic. Yuria explained to him that the evil eye can be used for several things, and spoiling is only a small part. For example, creating magical barriers or removing spoilage, and even creating medicines. So the evil eye also brings benefits to humanity. The hero thought about the fact that if she was in Japan, she would become a doctor. Perhaps even a respected one. He remembered the words of the vulture who said that the evil eye is the work of man. Almas asked Yuria, what about the hunger? The girl assumed it was because of the spoil. People said it was the work of a coven of witches. The hero asked if everyone was capable of casting such a curse. The girl replied that it was not a person, it was a nation. Such a powerful curse would take the lives of thousands of people. But she told him not to be afraid, for whoever did it would be punished, she promised him. Almas didn't understand what she meant. He suggested she come to Romalia sometime. Yuria was happy and asked if she could. True, she had to ask her father, he might not allow her to leave the city limits. In that case, the hero asked to teach him the evil eye. The girl pondered his offer, and Almas offered to do it for a small fee. Yuria was embarrassed, and said that she didn't need money, as they were friends. The hero was surprised. Yuria looked at him sadly, and said that she thought they were friends. The hero said that they were, because if they weren't friends, he wouldn't have carried her junk. The girl hugged him excitedly, which the hero clearly didn't expect. Falling from the hug to the ground, the guy asked why she couldn't teach him the evil eye. She answered him that it's not a problem, but the thing is that 90% of witches are women. And the difference between witches and witch doctors is huge. The hero asked her what about the other 10%. She could see if a person had the gift, but she didn't see Almas there. The hero decided that in that case they would forget it and said it was time to go home, and asked where she lived. Yuria became nervous and blushed. Looking around, she shouted that there was a Balton, and went somewhere. Almas again didn't understand anything. The girl asked if he was here, and asked him to come out. From behind, the guy was startled by some man who asked Yuri how he could be useful. He frightened the hero, who said that he stinks of booze, how much he drank. Yuria smiled at Almas, and asked him to introduce his assistant. It was the Alki Balton, her bodyguard. After drinking a small bottle that he had with him, the man smiled sarcastically and said that she loved him a lot. He smiled at the hero and thanked him for helping Yuria. Yuria asked Almas to give all the shopping to Balton. The hero asked why she didn't ask him to go with her himself. Yuria just knew that the perfume from him was just creepy. Agreeing, the guy gave everything to the man. Taking in the load, the man was shocked and seemed barely able to hold all the stuff. He thought to himself, how could Almas carry such an unsupportable weight? Almas said goodbye to Yuria, and she waved goodbye and told him that they would see each other again. Thanks to the caramel grass, they received a gold coin every month. 
the farming was also calm. Food was no longer a worry. But unfortunately other necessities were too expensive for them. Especially clothes and salt. So they needed to economize by providing themselves with other necessities besides food. Rosewood said they understood, and asked what they needed to do to do that. The hero explained that they would be making pottery, and they needed a kiln for that. Tetra asked where would they start. The hero wasn't much good at it, but they could build a traditional kiln. He asked everyone to get their hoe and supports. Siona asked him where they would build it, and Almas decided that they would build the oven on the nearest slope. The slope was necessary for building the oven, because hot air is lighter than cold air and will rise to heat the oven. And it would be easier to build it that way. The only problem is the labor intensity. Chopping wood alone could take a whole day. But Almas smiled and suggested we start. Not long ago when she and Yuria were shopping, the hero asked her what goods are considered valuable here. Yuria thought that Almas wanted to give her something. But the guy said that they had to exchange something for salt and clothes. The girl understood him and thought. She offered him earthenware, but the hero told her that it is sold in every shop. Yuria agreed, but the pots from Karija are much more valuable than the ones made here. They are durable and they have a beautiful color, so they are highly prized by the nobility. When he took the pot in his hands, he noticed that it was strong and beautiful. And all the pots made here are red in color and fragile. According to Tetra, Rosicrucian utensils are burned on an open fire. If you think back to his world, that's how it was done in Zemin and Yi. In other words, primitive technology. Because of the open fire, too much oxygen is supplied to the clay, and the firing temperature is insufficient. He thought, how could they fix it? They needed Anagama. The kiln would get hot quickly, and the closed chimney would restrict oxygen, which would give the ware strength and a beautiful black color. In other words, they would get Sue. Almas didn't know how pots were made in Karija, but he was sure they would surpass them. So right now, their goal is to create Sue ware. If they could manufacture it, their village would simply have a unique product. With Almas' blessing, chopping down trees was easy. Tetra sullenly asked him if he was definitely human. Even she could tell that he was stronger than a normal adult human. He could work for 10 people right now. The Griffon of course said that there was nothing special about this blessing, but for chopping trees it was just fine. When the chopping of the trees was done, it was time to start digging. Almas wiped the sweat from his forehead and said that was enough for today. Ron came up behind him and asked him where to dig next. Almas noticed clay in the ground. It was an important material in the making of utensils. It should increase the tightness of the furnace. Ron didn't understand what kind of air tightness he was talking about. In other words, the clay will prevent cold air from entering the oven and keep the heat inside. If too much air enters the kiln, the sioux will not work. Almas was thrilled, for they had only built the furnace from his memories from his past life, but it turned out much better than he thought it would. When everything was ready, he said it was time to start crafting. Ron and Rosewood started bullying each other and throwing clay at each other, while Tetra tried to pull a sausage out of the clay. Siona yelled at Ron and Wood, demanding that they stop and not throw clay. The other guy sitting next to Siona supported her, but all he got in response was clay in the face from Ron. The two boys rushed off, and Siona shouted at them not to even think about running away. Tatra called them idiots. Ron wanted to make fun of them, and said they couldn't even make plates. Tetra asked if they really needed to make so many utensils. Alma said it was important because they were fragile and their integrity was the responsibility of the children. When everything was ready, he suggested drying them. Rosewood told Ron that his plate had cracked, and Ron remarked that it was because he hadn't stirred the clay properly. The hero decided that he could fire it now, but he couldn't expect much from a kiln made by novices. After a while, he pulled out the finished pot and the children marveled. Almas thought about the delightful gray color it had, and decided it was Kurosabi. Simply put, a more expensive pot than the ones created in Rossix. The hero smiled. It wasn't bad at all for amateurs. Ron and Wood's pots broke, and Siona said it was all from their pampering. Alma said they'd still have a chance, and that next time, they just put more effort into it. They still had plenty of time. Now they had to get to work on the charcoal. The wood had to be stacked so that there was no space between the logs, 
and dry leaves were stuffed into the remaining gaps. Now Alma said he would light the stove. They would wait a little while, after which they would close the chimney and the entrance to the stove. The next day they would have coal. Tatra remarked that it was almost like making dishes. The hero agreed, in both cases, you couldn't give access to oxygen. The girl looked at Almas incomprehensibly and asked what oxygen was. The boy explained that it was needed to make fire. You could say it was part of the air, without which you cannot make a fire. Tatra asked why, in that case, oxygen doesn't burn itself out. Combustion is a chemical reaction in which carbon combines with oxygen. Anyway, oxygen does not burn itself out, but it is required for combustion. Tatra slowly began to understand. After a while, the boys smashed the wall into the furnace with an axe and noticed that things were bad. Most likely all from the lack of barrels and canisters, air was still leaking in, but they would survive the winter with it. Winter passed and the new year began. The Griffon told the hero that these children had roamed his forest, but now he was leaving them in his care and flew away. Almus asked Tatro what taxes are paid here. For every winter, the population of their village increases by 10 people. The girl told him that there were four main taxes in all. Land tax, population tax, income tax, and army tax. New children came to join them, and the hero thought about the fact that they had been abandoned by their parents to pay less. They asked them if they were from Rosicrucian. Tatra said that as far as she knew, people in Rosix paid less than people in other kingdoms. The king of Rosix is not one to rob his subjects. In that case, Siona didn't understand where they all came from. Siona told Almus that the children lived in Rosix. She told the hero that there was an influential family of aristocrats, the Ash, in Rosix. Siona wanted to say that they owned the land. Yes, and the head of the Ash family was betrayed by his own vassals. What's more, they're planning to secede from the Rosicrucians. Of course, the king won't approve of this, which caused a rift within the Ash family, so they lost a lot of people in the conflict and raised taxes to cover the losses, which emptied their supplies over the winter. After overhearing them, Tatra came in, asking if it was true. She ran out of the house. Running out after her, Almas asked where she was going and caught up with her and grabbed her by the shoulder. She turned around. Tears welled up in her eyes as she realized why her mom and dad had done this to her. Almas hugged the girl and told her it was okay. Taking her home, the hero put her to bed. Covering a blanket over Tatra, who had already fallen asleep, he thought about the fact that she had been through a lot. Walking in on them, Siona asked about what had happened to Thetra, but the hero himself did not know. That at least said that she had never seen Thetra cry. Almas told her that everyone wanted to cry sometimes and suggested she go. It was natural for children to cry if they had a nightmare or were homesick, and even for no particular reason, but children often cried. At times like this, he would comfort them, but this was the first time the boy had seen Thetra in tears. Ron asked the leader how Thetra was doing. Almas asked him not to worry and said that she was fine. In fact, he even felt better. She had been holding back tears for too long and children need to let their emotions out. He asked the children to behave normally when she woke up because he was willing to bet that she would be embarrassed. Almas offered to continue working in the field if they didn't want to wake up Tatra. Fetra and the new kids are their shared future. It seems the hero has a lot to think about to decide what to do next. In the kingdom of Rosicrucian, Yuria met Almas. Walking around the stalls and choosing goods, the guy asked the girl if she would let him see her father. Yuria said that her father was always happy to meet her new friends, so she thought about the possibility. She asked if he was sure that was what he wanted. The Romali forest borders four kingdoms, and Rossix is the most warlike, involved in several conflicts at once, and it's best to seek patronage from someone powerful. And her father, if he's got it right, has enough power to protect them. Taxes would be a problem, of course, but they couldn't rely on the griffin all the time. Yuria agreed with him. On the way to Yuria's house, the hero looked around, marveling at how many wealthy estates there were. At some point, he realized that they were walking towards the palace. Shocked, Almas thought she was joking. The king himself greeted the guy and said he was glad to meet him as his daughter's friend. Yuria completely forgot to tell the guy that her father is the king of Rossix. He nervously whispered to her. Why she kept quiet, 
After all, he was not ready for an audience with the king. The king looked at him. Coughing almost bowed to the floor and said that this was their first meeting and he was honored to know Lady Yuria. The king asked him not to be so formal and asked him to speak to him as the parent of his friend. This was the first time Yuria was introducing him to her friend. She had no friends in the past, out of focus on her studies. The girl exclaimed and asked him not to tell her about it. The king laughed and asked her to stop. In that case, the hero realized that she wasn't lying last time. The king realized that Almas was not looking for Yuria's father, but for an influential person to turn to. He smiled at the boy and told him to tell him his business. After all, he was Yuria's first friend and if he could, he would definitely be happy to help him. Almas thought about where to start, deciding of course not to talk about reincarnation because there were enough problems without it. After the whole story, the king frowned. He said that his citizens did not abandon their children in Romalia, and he believed that this responsibility was his. The hero begged him not to think him about the orphanage, for that was not what he meant. The king calmed him down and said it was all right. He had other things on his mind too. The king turned to the hero bowed to him and repeated that it was his direct duty to protect the people of this kingdom. Almas was shocked. The king himself bowed to him. He told the guy that if they wanted to become citizens of his kingdom, he would be happy to accept them. He was doing his best to protect the people and their property. After all, it was his duty. Almas said that at the moment they were relying on the griffin for food and hoped there would be no problems with taxes. The king smiled and said that there was a law in their country that no taxes were levied on newly annexed territories for the first five years, and he assumed that in their current state, they were not capable of paying taxes. The hero still believed that in five years, the children would already be able to take care of themselves when they grew up. Almas bowed and said that he understood. They would become citizens of Rosicrucian and pay taxes when due. The king agreed. At last, the children would have solid ground under their feet, and now they could breathe easy. The king asked the hero if by any chance they had any children from the Ash family. Alma said there were, and suggested that the taxes were too much for the parents and they had not survived the winter. The king thought for a moment and said he understood. The king asked to listen to him as he listened to the guy. He had three requests. The hero tensed up, he only had one, but it couldn't be helped. First of all, the king would like to visit his village to see for himself the truth of his words. The hero exhaled because it was logical. In the second place, he should continue to be friends with Yuri. Almas was not against it at all, but only for it. Lastly, he asked the hero to teach Yuri a math, which she was shocked by. The hero would be a bit confused and asked if he couldn't find someone more qualified. But the king knew he was better at math than many of his merchants. He was ashamed to admit it but his daughter was a real dunce. The worst of all is multiplication and division, where she's a complete swimmer. Yuria didn't seem to agree with it at all. The hero asked her a question. If they divide 100 grains of rice between 25 children, how much will each of them get? Yuria started counting on her fingers, then cheerfully said that the answer was 10. Almas realized that the matter was really bad, and the king said that she did not understand anything. If they were friends, the king had no doubt that he would help her. He held out one gold coin to the boy and said that he would receive it the first week of every month. The boy was surprised and pleased that he would even get paid. He bowed to the king and promised to teach Yuri math. The girl was horrified and said she wanted to study magic, not this nonsense. After the hero left, the king said he liked Almas. His brother came up behind him and asked him in surprise what he was up to but the king didn't seem to understand what he meant. How could this boy be allowed to teach Yuri? The king answered him that they were friends, and if she studied with him, she would most likely understand math better. The brother looked at the king unhappily and said that he didn't need to hide the real reason from him. The king admitted that he wasn't really up to anything, but rather laying the foundation. This boy is the leader of the group that the griffin is protecting. In other words, they are under his care. They were talking about that very scary griffin. Stories about people raised by animals, for example tigers or dragons, are not that rare in their kingdom. People love all sorts of legends and their people included. He might be useful in the future, so no harm will come to him here. He asked his brother if he understood him. Honestly, nothing useful had come to the king's mind so far. 
he needed to get a better look at Almas first. They would see each other every week, for he would be teaching Yuri. His brother was delighted and said that this was what was to be expected of the king. The king was embarrassed. He said he was not hopeless at ruling, but he was not great. He failed to protect Lego Ash. This is the main proof of his failure. The Ash are the most influential family in the country. Losing such an ally would seriously damage them. The king agreed with his brother's words, but that wasn't all. When he said that he couldn't protect them, he meant that in a way, they were actually supporting the other branches of the Ash. Because of this event, not only Ash, but also the other families are losing faith in them. Also, the neighboring kingdoms have united against them. That August bastard Herm dares to bring troops into their territory, and Hyena too, which means they don't have a son to inherit the throne, so the situation is dire. The king exhaled heavily and asked his brother not to make such a sad face. At least his queen had given him a daughter, Yuri. Even without a son, he was glad to have her. Soon after, her mother died of an illness, maybe it was fate. And the fact that the king's brother also didn't have a son, that was strange. The brother laughed nervously. He shouted at the king that they shouldn't be sad about the past, and there was still time. He suggested that the king choose someone worthy from the side branches of their family and marry Yuria. At this point, Yuria sneezed, and the hero asked her if she had a cold. The king said he wished for his daughter's happiness. He wondered why all the problems came down on their kingdom at once. The king felt as if Rosicrucian was falling under his rule. He turned to his brother and said that as long as he lived, he would like to find a solution, and he knew that this young man, the child of a griffin, would bring them hope. The king would like to see it with his own eyes. But King Rossix had no idea that his solution would turn out to be a miracle for all of Aldenia Peninsula, called the center of the world. Tetra had been acting strange lately. She had always been quiet, but now it was as if something was bothering her. The others were beginning to notice it, too. Almas decided to find out what it was. Cautiously, he approached Thetra and told her that she could always ask him and the others for help. He didn't insist on talking to her, but he did tell her that she'd been down in the dumps lately. The girl looked at him silently with the basket in her hands and said that he had noticed after all. The hero told her that it was obvious, given the way she had been acting lately, and asked if she could tell him what had happened. She asked that in that case he not tell anyone about it. Almas gave his word. She said her full name was Tatra Ash, and the hero understood. She had been acting strange after hearing about the attack on the Ash family. He suspected she had something to do with it. She asked the hero if he was surprised. Almas admitted that he was a bit surprised, and didn't expect a child from such a powerful family to be here. But truth be told, it's not that big of a deal where she's from. She smiled at him, and said she was glad to hear that, thanking the kid. The hero smiled back and asked what was the problem then. She wasn't sure, she knew her parents were dead. She could feel it, despite the silly hope that they were just being held prisoner. Still, she couldn't forgive this Robert Firm. He assumed she was talking about an ally and asked if he was to blame for her parents' deaths. She said that she and her father had been very close, so he was an ordinary commoner who rose to the heights of power. And this was how he repaid her father for his kindness. Kneeling down, she screamed that she would never forgive him. After a little silence, the hero quietly asked her if she wanted revenge. But the girl didn't know. Deep down she wanted to wipe him out, but she didn't want to leave this place. She hardly knew any of the ash, and had never been close to them. Her family was here, and they were her friends. The hero thought about the fact that she still wanted revenge on her family's killer, and said he understood. What was tormenting her was that she didn't want to leave this place because of her friends. He asked Thera not to worry, for they would never leave her. Thatra turned away from him and said that her parents said the same thing. In that case, Almas suggested that she focus on protecting him and everyone else. She was surprised, and the hero said that she was very even-minded and smarter than him. The girl smiled. Agreeing, she promised that she would protect them. Getting up from his knees, the hero remembered something else, and said that if she went to cause justice, let her warn him, and he would help in any way he could. He asked her not to take it all on herself, after all she was dear to him. The girl looked at him carefully and barely blushed. Apparently she had misunderstood him again, 
thinking about how everything was kind of sudden, almost didn't understand why she was acting this way. To make it more convincing, he decided not to use the blessing of language and tried to explain his feelings using his own knowledge of Adelnia. The hero thought about the fact that this girl was easily embarrassed. They were like brother and sister after all, and there was nothing to be embarrassed about. Tatra thought that she was just a coward, and if she could, she wouldn't let the opportunity pass her by. She barely got the words out that it was because she liked him. They were interrupted by Siona, who cut her off at the last words. Breathing heavily, she showed them the rich harvests she had found. Tatra was shocked, and Siona asked her if she was interrupting. Seeing some embarrassment, she turned around abruptly, and apologizing said she was leaving. Tatra couldn't stop her anymore. Running up to the boys, she shouted to them that Almas and Tatra were secretly dating, but they didn't believe her, and told her that she had misunderstood them. The hero smiled, and thought that she shouldn't have reacted so harshly, but Tatra was fine, thanks to the god Cyan, I guess. Another year passed, and the hero turned 14. He quietly said something to Ron in their language, and he noticed that he was now fluent in it. The boy thought about giving the griffin back his blessing of the language. Thanks to Thetra, he had mastered almost reading and writing in Cerishian. However, things were not going very smoothly. Upon arriving in town, he told the woman that he had come to pay the population tax for three people. The woman understood where he was coming from. He gave her the tax for himself, Ron, and Soyan. Luckily, the tax wasn't very high for now, but when the other children grew up, they wouldn't be able to pay it anymore. Besides, this was their last year under the Griffon's protection. Therefore, there was a need to increase the income. As he entered the house, he thought sadly about what to do next. Ruru was going through the wheat, and she looked menacingly at Rosewood. She asked him to think about grinding the wheat, asking him not to stand in a pole. The boy apologized and said he was bad at such things. Last year's grain picking was hard. Siona agreed that they almost died then. Almas asked not to tell them that they would have to grind again this year like last year. He wasn't ready for that. Tatra helped him put on a proper sweater, and the hero asked Graham how they had harvested the grain that year. She said that first they picked each ear by hand, and then with wooden blocks. The hero agreed that it was extremely labor-intensive. He walked over to the device and pulled the cloth off of it. He showed his friends the Senbakoki device. The first thing to do was to take a couple of spikes and put them between the boards. After that, he pulled the ears and the grains disintegrated. Siona was delighted, for it was a thousand times easier, except that the top part should be made of metal or bamboo. Wood is not very suitable. Tatra noticed that the design was simple, but it would make their job easier. She said Almas was a genius. Embarrassed, he thought to himself that he had just seen such a thing in a past life. Ron told the leader that the whole world should see it, but Almas said he had tons of other ideas besides this one. Now he wanted to talk about cleaning, that is, skinning the grains. Siona said sadly that cleaning was just as hard. Rosewood hoped that Almas had a solution for that too. The hero had bought a stone stupa, but it didn't make the job much easier. All they could do now was work hard. Ron had enthusiastically asked to leave it to him. Luckily, there were plenty of them, and Almas said they could do it easily. Then they had to separate the husks from the grains. Tatra bent down and picked up the basket, and the children asked her why she needed it. It was to be used to remove the debris from the grain. If you pour rice into it and shake it, the husks will end up on top because they are lighter than the grains. It's a long process, but by repeating it a few times, they would be able to clean the grain. The hero asked her to wait, for he wanted to check something else. He took the cover off the other device and said it was a sewer. To sift the grain through the fan, you have to drop it into the hole at the top while he twists the knob. He began to turn the knob, and in the meantime, Tetra sprinkled the grain. From the other side, the cleaned grain began to fall, and everyone was delighted. With just one turn, they had cleaned so much. Ruru felt a nice breeze. It was created by the blades inside. Almas noticed that the boys had figured it out, and said it was time to learn by trial and error. Taking the pen, he accidentally broke it. Tatra smiled, and remarked that it looked like they needed a new pen. The hero said they had taken care of the grains, but there was still something left to do. In the city, Almuza met Yuri, 
Dressed up, she asked him what she looked like. The hero smiled and said it was fine. She can, after all, when she wants to. Calling her mistress, she lost her temper. But Alma said it was in case they were being overheard. He wanted to talk to her about an important matter, but he wasn't sure if she would listen to him. The girl refused, since he was so high-minded, but it was worth asking in a conversational manner, she agreed. He asked her if she wanted to study math further. Yuria pitifully asked him if he was tired of teaching her, but the boy replied that he wasn't at all. Barely had time to get up from the table, the girl pounced on him, not wanting Almas to leave. The hero thought in horror that this was not what he meant. He felt her close to him and asked her to loosen her grip. Sitting back down, the busty Yuria apologized. Apparently she wasn't used to this herself. Almas had to teach her math, and he thought about the fact that the own had mastered it, and they had nothing more to pay him for. He told the girl that her training couldn't go on forever. She looked sadly at Almas and said that it wasn't up to her, it was probably best to talk to her father. When he came to the king, the king asked the hero if he wanted to teach Yuri anymore. He assumed that he and his daughter no longer got along, and if he left, she would be alone again. The hero said that wasn't true, and he just wanted to know how much more to teach her. The king understood him, but didn't stick to any deadlines, he just asked him to teach him everything he knows himself, and then asked him to just come visit them. Because who else would the king play shogi with if he didn't come? The hero chuckled nervously, because this shogi board he made himself. Adelia has a problem with entertainment, and creating a game based on martial arts would bring in a lot of money, so he decided to create shogi. Tatra cut out the figures and noticed that they were easily repeatable, so they wouldn't be good for selling. The hero looked at the knife and agreed with her. After all, no one here knows about patents. If someone decides to profit from his game, there's no way he can stop it. Without special materials or sophisticated manufacturing, they won't have a monopoly. He thought it was a good idea. Ruru thinks this game is too complicated, and Ron can't play it. The girl offered to give him everything. So he decided to present her to the king of Rosicrucian, hoping it would become popular with the nobles. He would be recognized as the creator of Shogi, and earn the king's respect. Taking out the game, the king asked his brother to sit down next to him. It seems he has become even more interesting to the king after Shogi. If he plays his cards right, he may be taken as a guard. A change of field in a new world didn't sound bad. But he'll think about that after the children grow up. And about training, he realized it was all for Yuria. Playing with the king, Alma said that she didn't seem to have any friends besides him. And suggested that she probably just didn't have the opportunity to do so. The king hesitated and said that she had quarreled with the families she was friends with, though he didn't remember the details. The hero asked the king if she was only allowed to be friends for profit. The king asked permission to explain that this was not the case. Because of her noble background, the children of commoners avoid her. But Almas knew that Yuria was not the kind of person to boast about her lineage. The king had noticed she wasn't either. If it was only about lineage, but for good or bad, she has a talent for magic. Her talent is without exaggeration one in a million, so when she grows up she will take the position of High Priestess. The hero thought about how that is a high profile title. He asked the king, isn't that classified information? He replied that everyone in the city knew about Yuria's talent, so for now he was satisfied with this state of affairs. It wasn't considered a problem for the king. It was also important that she was his only daughter. Her husband will inherit the throne, so those who covet power seek her favor. Yuria has no tolerance for people with such motives. In other words, candidates unaware of her background are preferred. The hero asked the king why not conceal her identity in that case. But he said it's a difficult task. If only because everyone in this city knows who Yuria is. And going outside the capital, for security reasons, is also ruled out. Besides, despite her looks, Yuria is very shy. His case is a happy accident. Her desire to buy a healing plant overcame her shyness. Almas thought about who would be a good friend for Yuria to befriend. He asked what about his children from the village. Stroking his mustache, the king said that was a good idea. Telling this to the king's brother, the king asked him if the king was sure about letting Yuria go to the Griffin Forest. The king thought to himself that his brother had already agreed with him. The brother told the king that he was sure the forest was safe 
because he had sent a mage in the guise of an owl to scout it out. The king fearfully asked his brother if this was too risky. After all, it represented enslavement of the soul. Dropping the details, he asked his brother what he had learned. Soul enslavement is a very dangerous technique that allows a mage to be possessed by an animal's body. As a result, the mage's soul returned back to his body, which meant the forest was safe. Besides, the boy wasn't lying. He really is connected to the griffin, so it's safe there. The king asked his brother, what's the problem then? Telling the king that it is a wild forest and there are no laws there, he asked him if Yuri needed friends that much. But the king told Raymond that he was missing something. He sent Yuria to Romalia to befriend a griffin. Raymond was shocked to hear him say that. But it was worth a try. Raymond drank and said he was probably still too naive. Also, we should not forget Almas. The boy had taken a liking to the king. And if he wanted, the king would make him his vassal. His brother agreed with the king that this boy was something. At his age, he knew not only math, but also Syrishan. There was not a more educated child in their kingdom. Raymond asked why not make him a landlord. The king grinned and said that to do so he had to become someone's son-in-law. His brother suggested that he was suitable. The king laughed and offered even himself. Upon arriving at the village, Yuria greeted all the children. She spoke of how Almas always took care of her. As a result, she was allowed to visit their village. The first official visitor to their village, she already got along with Ron and Rosewood and got to know everyone. But she seemed nervous. Siona immediately asked without thinking what their relationship with Almas was. Unashamedly, she grabbed the hero's hand and said they were a couple. Everyone including Tatra was shocked by her words. Ron and Rosewood said it was cool and the others said he was lucky to have such a beautiful girl. The hero freaked out thinking it was time for her to call it a day. Tatra getting furious asked Almas if it was true. Seeing the look in her eyes, the hero thought it was just some creepy thing and said she was just talking nonsense. Yuria smiled and said she was just messing with him. She assumed that he would be fine with it if she wasn't joking around. Turning around, she walked away. Walking up close to Almas, Tatra stepped on his foot with all her might and looked him in the eye. The hero asked her not to be angry and told her he was hurt. Still the girl stepped away from him and turned away, and Almas pressed his leg against hers. Smiling, he asked her not to be angry. A man came up behind him and smiling told him that it wasn't easy for him to be popular. It was Bolton Pompey. Sitting down by a tree next to a barrel of booze, he sipped his glass. The hero looked around. He thought that more guards would be allocated to protect Yuria. Balfon said that the king trusted him, so there was no need for that. So it's not because Bolton is a skilled warrior and can protect his daughter alone. It wasn't necessary. That's what Bolton doesn't like. He's just an alcoholic. Besides, he'd be more comfortable if he'd forget his duty and lie in the shade. If the king found out about it, it would be very unpleasant. Almas smiled and said he meant no such thing. But he was hiding something about Tatra. And she still seems to be angry. Tatra is connected to the kingdom of Rosicrucian. She is the daughter of Lego Ash. And if the king finds out about this, he will definitely take her away. To be honest, the guy was thinking about the fact that Tatra should go back to Rossix. It would be better for her. But she doesn't want to hear about it, particularly because of the arranged marriage. She once said to him, Who will teach him Carishian if she marries? Bolton was not allowed to know about Tatra. Tatra said that nobles come out at 12. She was 10 when she was abandoned, and he couldn't recognize her. Besides, he was drunk as a Fortipian. Balton asked about Mistress Yuri, and asked what they were going to play. The hero thought. He assumed that Yuria would teach them magic. Balton said that it didn't sound like games. Yuria prefers poisonous plant to roses. What games was he talking about? Here the man agreed with the hero. All he wanted was for their village to have nothing. He could teach them math but magic was beyond his reach. He was convinced that a knowledge of magic was necessary to live in this world, and maybe one of the girls would become a witch. Men are almost incapable of magic, but learning how to defend against curses would be useful. Besides, Yuria needed it. Teaching others would bring her closer to them. Yuria looked around for caramel grass. Balton told Almas that although he was a guard, he was a commoner, 
and asked him not to be nice to him. The hero smiled and agreed. He wanted to ask the man how he became a guard. As it turned out, King Rossix didn't care about your origins, he only cared about your skills and abilities. So when the hero grows up, he'll get him a job somewhere. In three years, when he turns 17, Bolton put his arm around the boy and said that he would become an official of some sort, and if he played his cards right, he might even get land. The hero said he was exaggerating and covered his nose from his breath. He smiled and said it was only a little. The country is not calm now, and help from the outside will not hurt. The king has high hopes for him. Becoming an official was not such a bad idea, but not until the children were grown. Bolton pointed his finger at the girls and asked if the boy was sure they could learn magic. The hero was sure, for they had done well in math. Bolton was shocked that he was able to teach them math and was even more surprised after the hero said that some knew it even better than Yuri. And the girl also speaks Carician and teaches other kids how to write and read. The man was shocked, and he wants to teach them magic as well. He assumed the hero was breeding geniuses here. Almas thought about the fact that Ron and the others could have become officials too. He asked Bolton about it, but he said it wasn't up to him to decide. Bolton now had to take up the matter as well. He asked the hero if they divided the fields by crops. Almas realized that he had been assigned not only to look after Yuria, but also to inspect the village. He explained that if the fields were divided, the yields would drop. Bolton took out a quill and a wooden tablet and began to write. Almas asked him, when reporting to the king, to say that it was his idea. He understood him and asked what the rest was for. The one that looked like a comb was called a sembakoki and the other a windrower. Bolton asked what they were for. After telling him about them, Bolton was astonished and said that this was not a village but a treasure trove of ideas. He was shocked that the boy had come up with it all by himself, but it only made the hero blush. Sinboki are easy to make, and it's better to make the teeth out of metal. Bolton asked if he could take a sainbok with him. The hero answered him that if he wanted to take it apart and understand how it worked, he better let him give him parchment and a quill, and he'd draw a diagram. Bolton was amazed, and said that was even better. He noticed that the utensils and charcoal were also homemade. He asked the boy what it smelled like, and the hero said it was a chrysanthemum plant. It's an insecticide they used against insects in the fields. Bolton was shocked that it was possible to get rid of bugs, and eagerly asked what other secrets this village had. The hero smiled and thought to himself that he just remembered it all from a past life. Bolton has learned more than he expected, but he's not a warrior or an official. Therefore, he couldn't properly evaluate all this knowledge. But all of this would definitely help the kingdom. He thanked Almas. They shook hands, and the boy asked to put in a good word for him. Bolton was sure that the gods had not forsaken them after all. Yuria beckoned to Almas, asking him to leave this spirited and join them. He turned to Bolton and said he had to go. Bolton joked and said that Prince Charming should answer the princess's call. Yuria heard him and calling him a miserable drunkard shouted at him to drown in his own glass. Bolton laughed. He couldn't think of a better death. The hero smiled and told him that he loved his drink. In the city of Rossix, the king asked the hero how they were doing with Yuri and his friends. The hero told the king that she was fine. He told the king he had something else he wanted to ask him and handed him the Bolton report. The king asked if this crop rotation was a proven method. After reading it, he said that it was indeed a good reason to call him out. Crop rotation is known as one of the factors in the agricultural revolution that took place in England in the 18th century. That is why it is an effective method. The hero thought about not telling the king about reincarnation, because then it would be difficult to explain everything. He told the king that it works in theory, but because his fields haven't gone through the whole rotation yet, he can't say for sure. The king then asked him to write down the total yield and send him a report. The king was also curious if this would work in his country. The hero told him that crop rotation was not very effective in small plots. It required large fields and lots of labor. For that they needed to get rid of the commonality of land and allow personal ownership of land. But the hero thought that it was difficult to implement this in the political system of Rosicrucian and apply it to all important families and farmers. The king replied that he did know his political system of the country. 
In fact, England had a land collection company called the Second Fence. Crop rotation was more productive because of this company. Guy doubted that this was possible for this country. The Rosicrucians had enough problems as it was. Basically, all the soldiers are concentrated on independent farming. And the reduction of independent farming leads to a decrease in the strength of the guards. In the Kingdom of Rossics, the soldiers provide their own weapons. For this reason, the strength and type of soldier is decided by how rich they are. The rich have horses and become cavalry, those with a spear and shield become spearmen, and the poor become infantry. Even if you didn't buy weapons, but had abilities you were highly valued, the rich families became even richer after the war. The king replied to Almas that still, there was no need to take land by force. This also applies to the clans of the Wolverines. The rich people are those who have large lands, they have slaves. The king said they should strive to slowly adopt crop rotation, and the hero agreed. This country is not England after all. In Rossix, it is possible from reforms from the top. A partial vision would be effective, because the hero's village is slowly adopting the changes. And if they had horses and cows, this process would speed up. The king said they would start with a main change. He wanted to introduce Senbensaki and Fanning to his country, for that he would reward him with whatever he asked for. The boy, without thinking about, asked the king for horses and the king agreed. He said he would give almost two horses and a year's supply of fodder. The hero was overjoyed because horses are very expensive and not every village can get at least one. Moreover, horses eat a lot and there is a chance that he will simply not be able to feed them. So a year's supply of food will come in handy. As expected of a king in this world, such a gift is equivalent to two cars and a year's supply of fuel. The king admitted that he underestimated the boy. After all, he had tutored his daughter and made interesting games. Granted the griffin is a genius. The hero got modest and said that the king was exaggerating. The king said he had a lot more to say about him, but he was interested in his opinion. The king asked Almas permission to have his brother Raymond present. Upon meeting the guy, Raymond was insanely happy to see him and offered to be his friend. He asked him if he would be his opponent in Shoggy. He would like to beat his brother. Almas said he would play with him when he had time. After the three of them sat down at the table, the king hoped that the boy understood the political structure of his country and asked what the hero thought about it. Down afraid, the hero said it was nonsense and said his kingdom was built on blood and territorial ties. There was once one generation of families, but the second and third generation seemed to be heavily mixed by blood and their loyalty to the country will slowly fade away. Their land was not given by the King of Razak, it is most likely a legacy from their ancestors. Since the aristocrats are ruling their own land, it will be a big problem. The King's military and financial power is dispersed throughout the land, and they are controlled by powerful families. So when war comes, it is difficult to adapt to it. But if one of the powerful families betray the King, the fighting power will be greatly reduced. For example, the Flood Control Project the interest from the nearby villages and towns is important. It will be difficult to do with the current system. And if the local aristocracy has marriage ties with other nationalities, it can greatly affect the war. The king and Raymond looked at each other thoughtfully. The king replied, replying to Almas, that there was no need to worry about that. Their citizens are forbidden to intermarry with other nationalities. The hero said that these strong aristocratic families should also be included in the law. If not, rebellions could spread throughout the country. After thinking about it, the king said that he was probably right and they hadn't considered it yet. Even if the marriage between strong families looks fine. If one family rebels, it will spread throughout the country. In that case, the king wanted to listen to Almas about his ideas to improve the political system. The hero thought about the fact that when you become friends with the nobles, they become interested in arguing about politics. If this was his world, he would be invited to an expensive restaurant. The guy thought about it and said that they should establish centralization. Japan, in his past life, started with Teiki reform and replaced centralized aristocratic politics with it. Heihei Shinken, the Meichai government, moved local government from Daimi territory to different prefectures. This concept was used several times throughout history. The king was out of agreement about centralization. His brother was surprised. 
After all, it turns out that even a child was thinking what they were thinking. The brother asked them what they thought exactly they needed to do. First, they needed to raise their authority. They need divine power to set their kingdom apart from others. The hero suggested they create a myth that the Razak clan are descendants of the gods. The king's brother thought about it, and the hero thought about the fact that he was not familiar with the divine myths of this world, but it would have to work. The king asked him if he would like to suggest anything else. The hero said that tax collection and military duty could be abolished for rich families. If they did that, it would be easier from here on, but if they continued, he wasn't sure he could help them. The king admitted that they had a secret plan to achieve centralization. Even though centralization is written in five characters, it's not that easy to achieve as expected from the king of Rosicrucian. But the king admitted that he didn't want to implement this plan for now. This cooking method is wrong, but he didn't want the ingredients to spoil. The king clutched his heart and said that when he thought about it, his stomach hurt. Why is there so little talent in his country? With these words, he coughed and bled. His brother was afraid for him, but he said he was all right. Riamund gave him a handkerchief to wipe his mouth. The king apologized to the boy and said that he would have found out sooner or later. Almas realized the disease and asked when did it all start. He was surprised when the king said it started as much as 10 years ago. Almas suggested that Yuria could have cured it, but the king only sighed sadly. He didn't believe she was capable of it and the hero asked how long did he have left. Closing his eyes and frowning, the king said he had no need to know. The king said that now it was his assignment as, and since he was very smart, he should carry out the centralization and asked him to finish it before he dies. The hero promised the king that he would try his best. Siona came running into the house and told the boys that Almas had returned. He brought something wonderful with him, and the boys wondered what it could be. They knew he was in the land of the Wolverines. Sione couldn't wait to see for herself, so she pushed Ron to go faster. When they came to a small cliff in the distance, they saw a guy with horses. The children greeted the leader and looked admiringly at the horses. Ron stroked the horse and smiled, for it was the first time he had ever touched such an animal. While everyone was admiring the horses, Rosewood noticed a girl behind him. The girl who was sitting on the horse noticed the guy's gaze on her but immediately looked away. Blushing, the guy asked Almas who she was. The hero said that it was Rhea and she was his slave who was given to him. Rosewood wondered why such a girl was a slave. The hero answered him that not every man knows how to take care of a horse. To deal with horses, one must know a lot about them, and then I told the king of Rosicrucian about it. One also had to practice riding horses. In that case, the king said he would provide them with a slave who knew how to take care of horses. It would not be a problem for them if they had such a person. The king asked his brother Raymond to take Almas to the stables. There they met Ri. The hero introduced himself to her and said that he was pleased to meet her, after which the girl said something in a language he did not understand. Raymond said she was speaking German. The hero told the boys if they wanted to say something to her, let them ask through him. Almas would like them to treat her as one of them. The lab noticed that Rosewood was interested in her and asked if that was the case. Rosewood waved his hands and said that it absolutely wasn't. But the hero asked him not to be shy. Siona approached Almas and asked where was her souvenir. In response, the guy opened the sack that was on the horse's back and gave her some roasted meat. Siona asked Ron to open his mouth and gave him a piece. From the looks of it, they looked like a love couple, and Almas figured it was adolescence. He said that all 14-year-olds are weird in love. As an older brother, he felt contradictory. A smiling guy came up behind them and said he had killed a boar. Ron, startled, asked him who he was, but it was only Graham. Even though he is only 12 years old, his body looks much stronger than the others. They were also approached by a satisfied Lulu, who said that she was her beautiful self and the best. She was wearing a camouflage outfit and was tracking the boar with her witch magic. She was pleased because Yuria told her that she had a talent for witchcraft. Besides, Soyoung and Tetra are also strong. The hero was happy that everyone was developing here. He suggested that everyone go back and expand the fields. Thanks to the horses, everything would be many times faster. Everyone was immensely happy upon arrival. Almas told Tetra that he had returned and asked how the goats were. 
The girl said that they had eaten almost all the plants in the wasteland, but the guy was not surprised, because these animals eat almost everything. He turned to Rhea and said he would leave the horses to her. He asked that she take Rosewood with her. Tetra didn't know her yet, and Alma said she would take care of the horses. Tetra looked at the contraption that was on the horse and asked what was that thing they were dragging. The hero said he got it with the horses. If they were going to use them for farming, he would need a plow and a baron. Also, Almas gave them a structure for plowing the land. After that, they drove the horse forward and the work progressed. The boys were shocked at how fast the fields were being plowed. Ron noticed that something was wrong with Rosewood, and he said that the thing was a pain to hold. Siona said that the speed was now on another level, as expected of a horse that had put their former efforts to shame. Almas offered to get the plow ready for next time and said they should learn to ride the horse quickly. Stroking the animal, Siona asked Almas if he had thought of anything new. The hero thought of hemp. Hemp is often used as a drug, but for Yuria, hemp in witchcraft is needed as a painkiller. Even though she has heard that some countries do this, it really isn't used as something forbidden. As a result, hemp is not used as a drug on the Adelina Peninsula. Hemp seeds also had great nutritional value. It is an annual plant. It is also fast growing and can be harvested the same year it is planted. Hemp can be replanted many times and will not cause them problems. Siona also suggested that he wanted to make clothes out of it. Alma said that they would harvest fibers from it, but not for clothing, but for something else. Honestly, he didn't even know what else it could be used for. He decided to grow it to make gear. Griffon's support ends this summer. The taxes they pay to the village go up every year. In this case, it's a financial crisis. That's why their village had to produce some products. He also told the guys that there was one candidate for a special product and asked them to follow him. After walking into the building, he said that they have three ways of knowledge in Adelina Peninsula, papyrus, sheepskin, and plank. Papyrus is too fragile and sheepskin is eaten by insects. The blackboard is very small, which is why it's hard to write a long sentence on it. But he knows another medium which is much better than all these, and its name is paper. Tatra asked what good it would do them since most of the inhabitants can't write. The hero said that they would sell it to someone who needed paper, and the girl assumed it was a king. Unlike regular people, kings need to write down history, but they will need paper to keep it longer. After all, they would need it for future professions, and there might also be a paper maker. The girl smiled and agreed. After traveling far from the village, Siona and Tetra asked why they had traveled so far. Alma said they needed water. By digging a hole on the bank of this river, they could create a mini swimming pool. The materials they need are submerged in water and hemp, which he also bought. Tetra asked why it all needed to be submerged in water, and the guy said it would soften her up. If it doesn't soften, they won't be able to remove the rest of the black bark. By doing this, they will get vegetable fiber, but this time they won't do it seriously. But the more thoroughly they do everything, the better the paper will turn out. The next thing was to add ash to the water. It would become a white nozzle liquid white in color. This was also called lye. They needed lye, but they could do it with simple lye. The lye could be used to harm the body. Now they had to mix tree bark, hemp straw and lye together and start boiling. The girls looked at the brew with interest. It was like a stew. Ron came in smiling at them, and holding his stomach said he was hungry, and they smelled good. But Alma said that if he ate it, he would get a stomach ache. He said we had to wait for it all to cool down. They needed to wash it and let it go in the water in the pool for one night. Ron asked how much longer, and the hero said that the work in the fields could be finished for today and suggested a snack. Under the leader's guidance, Ron tried making starch from wheat flour. Almas asked to mix the glue from the starch with the liquid and the base of the material would be made. This was the base of the paper, now we need to shape it. Tetra thought that this thing should draw water, and the hero told her that it was called a paper tray. He suggested pouring the mixture into the tray and shaking it to smooth it out. Tetra was surprised, for it looked very beautiful. Almas said that this should be repeated several times. They should remove the top of the mold and leave it to dry. Tetra asked if everything was okay and everyone was getting impatient to see the result. The guy smiled and said it wasn't bad. 
From now on, they could produce good paper and very even smooth paper. Taking a sheet from the stretcher, he didn't even think it would turn out so thin. The children were surprised at what they saw. It was the first time they had ever seen paper, and it was amazing to them. They noticed that it was lighter than sheepskin and softer than papyrus and more comfortable to write on than Plax Tetra said that they could create mass production and sell it. Almas mentally thanked the Chinese man who had created this paper. But here and in the New World, he could be the most famous. The boy offered to sell the paper to the king. Almas went to the king and gave him the paper. After trying it out and writing a few lines, the king said it was excellent. Their village could now create paper and they would like to present a few sheets to the king of Rosicrucian. The king smiled and said he would buy all of them. He asked the hero, what was the method of creating this paper? Almus was doubtful, for what profit would it be to him if he told? But the king answered him that he was only joking. He asked if he could buy paper from them for three years, and he also asked to improve the quality of the paper. This he asked by the king's order. And when they improve its quality in three years, they will start buying it collectively. But will it be good? The king said he would like to have paper production established in his country, but it was not yet of sufficient quality. Until the quality of paper got better, the king left its production to them. And that is why he would allow it to be sold somewhere else. As expected from King Rossix, he even thought of selling it to other people. Whether it be an evaluation of his homework or Bolton's report. It seems he doesn't really trust people, but the village's income sources became stable thanks to him. And so another year went by. The time of the Griffin's patronage is over. Eventually that day came. Crop rotation, pottery, charcoal, personal income from teaching, paper. Sure, there were some hardships, but the village remained stable. I wonder what would have happened if he hadn't met the Griffin in the forest. Well, for one thing, he wouldn't have gotten the blessing of the tongue. Almus walked over to the Griffin. The Griffon told the lad that he had done well, and that of the children, none had even died. The hero smiled and said he hadn't done anything wrong. But the Griffon noticed that he was being modest. The one who got the support of King Rosicrucian and him. The one who motivated the children, it was him. He asked the kid if he still needed the blessing tongue, but the kid said no. To be honest, he needed it to keep in touch with Rhea, but that didn't apply to the Griffon Pact. Rhea was already beginning to understand their language little by little. Meanwhile, Rosewood was diligently learning Germanic, which Thetra was shocked by. Rosewood's dummy was learning. He must have really wanted to talk to Rhea. Love works wonders. In that case, the Griffin said it would take him back. At that moment, the guy felt something like something had been taken away from him. The Griffin said to come to him and report back regularly. And if he felt lightheaded out of gratitude to him, have him bring him alcohol on a regular basis. The boy agreed. Tatra met Almas and asked how the Griffin was doing. The hero said that he asked her to send his congratulations and to bring him some fruit wine. So the work requested by the Griffin is over. Almas agreed, now the village doesn't need anything and they have developed well. It was abandoned at first. Now it's probably better than some places here. It's true that everyone is working hard. He told Thetra that they had done a good job. He asked her to get everyone together, for he had one announcement to make. Turning to everyone, the hero said that he had heard from Yuria and made sure that this year's harvest in the kingdom was much bigger than before. But the children didn't understand what he meant by that. Almas reminded Rosewood that he was born in Rosicrucian, in which case he could go back home. All those who were born in Rosix could go home. Here were other children besides Rosewood who were born in the kingdom. If they lost Rosewood along with some children, they might face a labor shortage. But even so, it didn't matter. Children had to grow up near their parents. Now that the treaty with the Griffin was over, those children who could go home should go home. The hero didn't know his parents, but these children are different. That's why it's much better to live in the Razik kingdom now. So he urged everyone who is from the kingdom to go. He didn't keep anyone. Rosewood told the hero he was an idiot. Almas asked what he meant by that. He thought at the loss of the blessing he had gotten bad at expressing his thoughts. But this village could survive without the Griffin's support. Rosewood agreed that they loved their parents, but they had been abandoned once. No matter how desperate they were, it was simply unforgivable. 
and even if they had plenty of food now, they wouldn't be welcomed there when they returned. The children knew they could be kicked out again, or sold into slavery. Rosewood cried out that they would never think of going back there. Now the hero thought about it. Going back to the parents who abandoned you. The likelihood of them leaving you is high. He should have realized that, but for some reason he didn't think about it. As an orphan, it must have been very embellishing for him to have the image of his parents in his mind. It was his complex, and he had recklessly given away his ideals to the others. Rosewood smiled and said they wouldn't bring it up. After all, all the children only love Almas herself. Ron smiled and asked the leader not to leave them, but to lead them on. They are related to him in any way. Siona said that they love him for everything. Ron turned to the children and told them to raise their hands if they wanted to go back to their parents. But there was silence. But who wants to follow the leader? At that moment, everyone raised their hands. Is there anyone who can get through this crowd? Who really wants to return to their parents? But this is just the beginning. Almas remembered how they all cried while shouting their parents' names at night in their sleep. So why Tatra smiled and told him that everyone here loved him. Siona, noticing the boy's glistening eyes, asked if he was crying. Turning away, the guy said he never would. Gathering himself, he turned to the kids and said he would continue to be their leader, so let them continue to follow him. The kids all cheered him on at once. The hero thought it was all suspicious, as if it was all planned. Siona realized that they had been figured out and said that they had recently heard a conversation from Thetra. That's when Ron decided to make Almas cry. Ron turned the whole thing over to Rosewood. But Rosewood demanded that he not lie. They got into an argument, and Ron said he even rehearsed his lines. And the other was coming up with a unifying shout at the end. Almas scratched the tip of his nose and said he was lucky to have them. Jeroy asked Yuria if magic was always so boring. She didn't mind him watching them, but today they were practicing putting up a magical barrier. She asked him not to do anything to distract them. Almas thought about the fact that the barrier could dispel curses. The whole witchcraft thing is rather questionable. There was an incident recently. Tatro brought the hero a potion. She asked him to drink it, saying it was made with witch magic. Almas asked if it was dangerous, but Tatra sternly told him to drink it. He also noticed that the girl was wearing two revealing clothes and asked if she was cold. She said she wasn't and ordered him to drink. The hero turned to the goats and thought they were on time. He gave the potion to the goats and asked them to drink. The hero was shocked after what was happening to the goats. Apparently it was a love potion. Not to mention how they tried to put spoil on the tree. It took a long time for it to start wilting and Yuria asked if the leader had any complaints about that. He asked her if she could make the tree dry up instantly, and Yuria agreed. But it was a waste of energy. The hero only noticed that the monster detector was indeed a useful thing. So Yuria shouted to Lulu that she had left. It's certainly good that it's useful, but using things like animal fur to hide the smell is strong. After all, it stinks a lot. Or jumping from roof to roof to learn how to hide their presence. Or them coming back after training like a half-wild animal. That's terrible. Isn't it because Yuria didn't train them properly before? Yuria asked the guy not to put all the blame on her, saying that it's been like this with Lulu since the beginning. She asked him to stop Lulu and concentrate on magic. Juriel remembered that Soisen had a great technique and could transfer his soul into the body of an animal. Yuria said that was not all that witch's magic could do. Almas thought it was an incredible feeling to find himself as an owl and fly through the forest. It was the only thing that would make him think of the benefits of magic. But after she returned to her body, she tried to turn her head like an owl. And owls can turn their heads 180 degrees. It was a tragic incident. The girl shouted that it was all Ron's doing to tease her. Yuria understood how Soyan felt and asked her to calm down. The hero exhaled and said that which magic is really questionable. The girl said something in an incomprehensible language. She had fire burning in her hand and asked him what about it. She could create fire quickly, but it usually takes a lot of time, but since they could use flint, it was a waste of magical energy. Whereupon Almas noticed that the fire had disappeared. She asked him if it was useful. It was cool, but like she said, it's a waste. The hero asked to show her again, and Tatra paid attention to them. 
she had an idea on how to use it. As he stretched out in bed, the guy thought about how waking up in the middle of the night was really hard, but he wondered what Yuria needed at this time. She said she'd come over at night, her dad let her. The hero looked at the moon and thought it was beautiful. There are no alarm clocks in this world, and he has to wake up all the children himself. Of all the children, waking up Tatro was the hardest. It takes a lot of work. She gets angry when he wakes her up late. He decided he'd start getting up after his bath. But then he noticed something. Down in the pond, Tatro was standing naked. When she turned around she saw Almas, she turned away and crouched down. She asked him if he saw anything, but he said he only saw her back. She wondered if he was lying, and Almas assured her that he hadn't seen anything. Embarrassed, he asked the girl what it was on her side. It looked like a mole. She pointed to her side and asked if he wanted to look closer. It looked like a tattoo. The girl said it was their family crest, and every member of an influential family had one. Probably Yuri's too. In Japan, where he came from, tattoos were considered special. But in Western cultures, tattoos are part of the style. He also heard that it was common for people in the Yaoi period to get tattoos. But in Adelia, they are used as a marker of social status. Maybe those who are related to magic have them as well. She asked him not to stand there like a statue, and handed him some clothes. He thought about the fact that before he had looked at her as a daughter or a sister. But now he felt like he was watching his childhood friend grow up. And if he added the fact that she was already 13, there were many possibilities. He was shocked at himself, and cursing asked himself what he was thinking. Getting dressed, the girl said she'd done something amazing, so he could count on that. The hero asked Yuri what was it that she wanted to show. Did it have something to do with Tatra's invention? Yuria smiled and said that he would probably be surprised. He was already surprised after he saw Bolton lying on the ground while he worked. Rosewood shouted that Thetra here, and everyone was wondering what she had come up with. She unfolded a red geometric symbol on paper and placed the parchment on the table. The hero asked where she found the red paint, and Thetra said it was her blood. Almas was scared because it was dangerous, but the girl said it was fine, and she treated the wound as he had taught her. She asked Ron to put out the light and got to work. The girl put her hand to the symbol and summoned the light. The whole place lit up and everyone's jaw dropped. She asked Almas to try to do it. Siona nudged him, but he said it was witch magic, but he decided to give it a try. He was surprised that he succeeded, and he asked how is that possible? There are only two things you need for magic. The first is the power of the soul. Girls have stronger souls. But even so, all girls have it differently, and only a few can control magic. Yuria menacingly asked the guys, did they realize that? But this is easily compensated by bringing in the power of magic from outside. This can be done with the sacrifice of a witch's blood or a magic stone. Ron asked his friend what a magic stone was, and he whispered in his ear that it was a stone containing magic power. It can also be mined. And the second thing is the experience and skill of the magician. Mostly it happens instinctively. And some with a talent for magic can do magic tricks from childhood without realizing it. To draw an analogy, it happens just like breathing. Even if you ask a person to teach you how to breathe, there are not many people who will actually teach you how to do it. Even so, magic can be summoned through dance, and it is also inherited. And when a person reaches the first grade of magic, they will already be able to use magic just by thinking about it. But Almas didn't understand how he was able to use magic. Yuri explained that basically magic comes from the blood of Thetra, and summoning magic is done through this geometric symbol. She drew a symbol that represents the whole process of summoning light magic. In the same way, it could be drawn on paper and carried anywhere. The summoning process itself is already complete. It could be activated by anyone just by thinking about it. Almas wondered who had thought of it. Tatra said it was trial and error and arithmetic. Arithmetic is the foundation of the world. Almas was surprised and assumed she was also from Greece. Tatra called it a magic formula. The hero looked at Yuria and said that Tatra had probably invented something new, since he didn't remember it in the books. But she said that she had already told him about it. Throughout the history of witches' magic, dances, songs, and spells had been created. 
but Tatra had added something valid to the story. Almas had thought that this way everyone could become witches and witch doctors, but Yuria said that was not true. There is a kind of magic that will not be affected by arithmetic. Thatra was in agreement with Yuria. There are things that arithmetic cannot explain, such as the square root, the ratio of circumference to diameter. Almas was sure that Thetra was indeed an amazing girl. After all, he was the one who taught her math. And the ones who made the big breakthrough in witchcraft was Tetra. Now they can combine witchcraft and formula magic. And it can be used even by those who have no talent for magic. Despite that, jinxes are not compatible with it. Yuria turned to the guys. And yet there are spells that can be expressed in formulas and those that can't. Does that mean that they have nothing to do with witchcraft? The most important magical part of a formula is the arithmetic calculation. And Yuria thought about how this could really be considered a whole new discovery. In that case, it's up to Almas to decide. Tatra smiled at him, and the hero wondered if he should decide such a thing. Someone who had lived in a leading nation in his past life, he should have just waited. The hero asked what about sorcery. He also wanted to call it magic, but they already have witch magic so probably witchcraft wouldn't fit anymore. Tatra smiled and said that in that case she was a sorceress. She would be the very first sorceress in this world, and her middle name would be Progenitor. She smiled slyly, and the boy thought to himself that despite her age, he was still worried about her. A year later the village had become lively, they now had as many as 70 people living there. The hero told Tetra that was quite a lot. The girl said that the people were fleeing from heavy taxes, and they found them unconscious in the woods and took them in. And after that, within a year, 30 more people were added. The people turned to Almas and said that they had finished repairing the roof. The hero thanked them and said they could rest and have a cup of tea. He asked Tetra in a whisper how the adults they had taken in were doing, and if she and Ron were fighting. There were about six adults among the people they had taken in. At the moment, they have a good relationship with Ron, rather even attached to him. They are all good people. They are physically strong and also very wise. Thanks to them, they learned how to cook, and it was fun. The introduction of horse tilling contributes to this, but because the adults are strong enough, they have been able to greatly expand the fields, which produce abundant crops. Right now the village has enough supplies for the population, and they produce more than they consume. Almas smiled and said that was good. He told Thetra that he would go, and she asked him to give the griffin his best wishes. The hero brought the griffin some wine, and they smiled at each other. The whole huge jug was small for the griffin, and yet it goes on sale. It is a valuable thing. The griff asked how the people were doing, and the hero said they were doing well. He thanked the griffin, but the griffin said he hadn't done anything special. The griffin gave the empty jug to the guy, and said that even though it wasn't much, it was still their most valuable commodity. He told the hero that even though they had become more or less independent of him, he would still have nightmares if they died of impoverishment. There was one more thing he wanted to say. Griffon told Almas that if one day, he or his descendants were to find themselves in a predicament, depending on their relationship, he could still lend them his help. Almas was surprised at his words. He was grateful to the Griffon, but he hoped it wouldn't come to that. The Griffon hoped so as well. With these words he flew away, and the hero returned with the empty jug to the village. Tatra calling him her favorite was glad to see him back. The hero did not realize when it was that they had time to get married. The girl grabbed the guy's hand and pulled him behind her and told him it was not the time to be so surprised. She asked him to hurry up and follow her. The hero said he reacted that way to her absurd statement and asked what was the matter. As they approached the house, Ron jumped out of it and asked Almas to get in here faster. Inside he saw a bunch of people, from old people to children. He was shocked. Where did all these people come from? Siona said that there were only 30 people here and they came here right after Almas left. And since they obediently did what they were told, they left them here. Almas was approached by a guy who assumed he was a representative of the village. He told the hero that they were from the same village in the kingdom of Fermir. His name was Earl, and he acted as the acting head of the village. They ended up here after escaping from the village. Siona thought that their kingdom was also afflicted by famine, for their kingdom had always been weak against curses, 
and so they were always tormented by hunger. The hero pondered over these words. When the Faramir Kingdom was founded, there were many mages of the voodoo sect, and there weren't many voodoo sorcerers who could erect barriers. Moreover, their tax was increasing every year, and they would execute them if they didn't pay it. At first, the people wanted to escape to the Du Kingdom, but it's hard for them to cross the border without being seen, so they didn't know where to go. Then a rumor reached them about this forest. Rumor has it that there is a paradise deep in the forest, guarded by the griffin herself, and that abandoned children live happily there. Earl would never have thought such a thing possible. The hero notes that it isn't. They farm the land to feed themselves. Wood told Ron that they probably got famous from selling animal skins in the capital. Eventually their village was known because every day they came and sold something. Also when they shared some food with the people they found in the forest, they started asking lots of questions. And they helped people who were lost in the forest. Maybe that's why they became known. Since then, the hero thought of introducing the shogi to the king, and the king often spoke cheerfully about their village. Almas asked Earl if they wanted to stay here. The men knelt, and begging to stay said they would do anything they asked. The hero wondered what he should do, since there were a lot of people. Not to mention the potential danger, in case the adults wanted to take power away from the children. Here a girl approached Rur. The hero assumed it was her family. The girl wanted to touch her, but Ruru shouted in tears not to touch her. She shouted to the woman that it was too late to act like a real mother. After all, she had abandoned her. She turned to Almas and said she was against taking them in. She suggested that these people be returned to the kingdom immediately. It was foolish to worsen their relationship with the kingdom for the sake of these people. Ron scratched his head thoughtfully. Ron supported Rura and said that he was against these people. Edward supported Ron and said that they had nothing to do with them. Siona looked back at her friends, she was confused, and only in favor of accepting the people because they were abandoned and just ran away. They are just like children. Someone raised their hand and said they agreed with Sian. The guy said that they should help each other in trouble. The hero noticed that there was a mother and a small child among the people. He asked about Tatra's opinion, but she was against it. She couldn't trust people. She suggested that it could just as well have been a strategy by Firm to take over the village. Almas wondered how he should proceed. He decided to go to Firm's kingdom and find out everything. He asked the boys to keep a close watch on the people until he returned. Ron smiled and said he could count on him. Tatra said she would go with him. She wanted to make sure the people were honest. The hero understood her. Almas told the men that they would provide them with food. And as long as they stayed here, they would do as they were told. He hoped they wouldn't do anything suspicious, and the people bowed in thanks. Siona asked the hero to be careful. The hero wanted to tell her about Rura, but Siona asked him to leave it to her. Alma said that they would go on horseback, and Tatra sullenly asked if he knew how to ride it. As he approached the stables, the hero asked if Rhea was there. He told her that he was going to ride a horse and asked her to prepare one. After stroking the horse, Tatra asked him if that was what he wanted to do. She knew the boy didn't know how to ride. But Alma said that was no problem now. He put the stirrup on the saddle and showed the girl. The stirrups are put on both sides to rest on. Rhea could ride the horse without any equipment, but the hero unfortunately fell down the last time. It was similar to the world he came from. In that era strive was not yet. Not everyone could be a cavalryman. Because it's hard to use your weapon when you can't put your feet in a stable place. But the stirrup would help with that. Even a beginner like him would be able to ride a horse without much training. It's something he has to be careful with so as not to cause any militaristic reforms. That's why no one knows about it except Rhea. He also asked to keep a secret about it to Fetra as well. The girl noticed that it was iron and asked if the hero had made it himself. But it was made by Yuria and the guy asked Thetra to climb on the horse. Thetra smiled and jumped up so that the hero involuntarily looked at her butt. After the girl sat down in front of him, she frowned at him and asked him to be gentle. The guy apologized and they hit the road. Rhea waved goodbye to them. On the way, Tatra asked Almas if King Roland was always an ambitious man. The hero said that might be true. But everyone always loved him. From the way Earl and the others behaved, they hated him. Tatra said that a long time ago he seemed like a kind man and was close to her father as well as to her. 
She had no hatred for him. Almas listened to her. Soon the sun began to set, and the hero offered to pitch a tent. The next day they reached the town. Tatra looked and assumed this was Earl's village. The hero noticed that the place looked like the people described. There were still people here, so the hero decided to ask them. Getting off his horse, he said hello and apologized, asking what happened here. The people looked at each other in surprise. One of the men said that every single one of them had abandoned this village that night. They were now forming a search party, which was annoying. Almas wondered why they did that. The men said about the heavy taxes and that they had no money to pay. It was probably about them. A stern man with a sword came up to them and asked what they were doing here. Alma smiled and said they were simple traders. They were heading north, so they were passing through this country. Then the hero saw the soldiers gathered in this village, and he wondered what had happened here. Opening a bag of dried fruit, the guy handed it to the people and asked them to treat themselves. Taking a piece, the villager smiled, and looking at the horse thought that it was good to have such an animal. The soldier looked at Thetra and asked if she was his wife. Almas turned to her and smiled saying that they had only recently gotten married, and asked her if that was the case. Tithra blushed all red, clutching her hands to her face. She said that it was true, they were newlyweds. Almas handed the sack to the soldier and asked if there was anything he could sell. Or maybe the soldiers need something. The soldier grimly said that they don't need anything, because they already have trouble paying for their own food. Still, the soldier asked for three pieces, and the guy said they could have as much as they wanted. Still, how are they going to bring back the residents who escaped? Moreover, where could they have escaped to? In all likelihood, they escaped into the forest. The soldier assumed that they had gone to the Griffon Sama paradise like everyone said. He himself wondered if that was true. The hero asked them if it would be too hard to search in such a forest. The soldier said it wasn't too hard because they had voodoo sorcerers, and pointed his finger at the girl who was sitting in a cloak and stroking a dog. He said they would find people quickly with the help of the dogs. The soldier said it must be nice to have such useful voodoo magic. He hoped they could also be useful in life besides fighting wars. The hero thought about the fact that using soul retrieval on a dog would be a problem. Speaking of the griffin, he asked people if it would be right to climb into the depths of the forest. The resident said that the oin were scared, and yet it was the king's order. This man was not concerned about possible divine retribution. From his point of view, instead of being afraid of the griffin, he should definitely bring back the escaped villagers. They might bring them back, but they would have to do so in the form of their corpses. It was already tomorrow that they needed to move out to look for them, but they didn't really feel like doing that. After playing with the dog for a while, the hero said that he couldn't seem to sell anything here. In that case, he decided to move on. After paying the soldier a couple of coins, Almas thanked them for the information and wished them luck. The soldier was surprised and wished them the same. As they were leaving, one of the villagers said that the girl was quite nice. Tetra looked worriedly at the hero and said that they would be coming to their village soon, and Almas replied that trouble was coming. Still, they had found out what they wanted, so they needed to hurry. Opening the gate to his friends, Ron asked how everything went. The hero confirmed that Earl and the others were innocent. Almas made sure that everything was fine in their village. He asked Ron to gather the men to tell them what he had learned. Siona, Tatra, and Wood listened attentively. The hero told them that the soldiers would be here tomorrow. Wood offered to just hand the men over. Alma said that King Ferm planned to make them an example to others. To make the others aware of what would happen if they escaped. He told the boys that if the humans were returned, they would kill them all. Everyone was shocked and Almas asked them to tell him first. He thought about the fact that it was impossible to give up on them. And the reason was that the king would attack their village and they would need men to stand up to him. Originally, there was no road in this forest for people to pass through. So this village is protected by the forest and it's not easy to find. But since Earl and the others came here, they could find them by smell. If they gave up the people, they would tell the king about this place. And then the guy was sure that they would be attacked. Learning that they had only 70 men, they would think they would be easily defeated. But if they took the men and Earl, they would already have a hundred. With their help, they could at least intimidate them into not attacking. He asked his friends what they thought. Ron agreed with what he said. 
Rosewood also agreed to help the people. Siona also knew it would be too cruel to leave them behind. Everyone looked at Rura. Reluctantly, the girl said that her parents were there. And if they left them to die, it would be like what they did to her. So she agreed with the others. No one was against it, and everyone decided. They didn't have a lot of time, so they headed over to Earl and the others. Almas told the people that they were willing to take them in. But he pointed out that it's only temporary. It would depend on their behavior. The men bowed to Almas, and he thought about whether it was worth talking about the soldiers. While he was pondering, Ron ran up to their house and said that the Ferm soldiers were heading this way. They were still in the depths of the forest, not that far away from them. But there was no doubt that they were coming this way. Ruru said that she sensed them using detection magic. It was only a matter of time before they arrived. Earl asked Almas what was going on. Almas told the men that the king was following them and would be here soon. He assumed that he was going to kill all the people who escaped. To warn the others in this way. The people were terrified and depressed. Earl demanded that they calm down. Bowing down he apologized to the hero for their behavior, saying that they had caused them trouble. Almas clutched his head and said there was nothing more to be done. And even if they handed them over to the king, they wouldn't let them go in peace that easily. In that case, Earl said they'd join the fight. And that's exactly what was needed. Earl knelt before Almas and said that they would never forget their kindness. He had a little experience in trading. He used to do it all over the world, besides having experience in negotiations. He hoped he would become useful. In that case, Almas asked for help and asked Earl to follow him. He asked Thetra to tell everything in the village. After arriving at Almas' house, the hero asked Earl to tell him how to negotiate. An important aspect is to bring the parties to the negotiation table. He must make them think that negotiation is better than battle. To start, he needs to arm everyone and meet the king outside the village. Almas asked if he was sure about this. Moreover, they want to be pacifists, but wouldn't that be a provocation? Besides, it would be advantageous for them to defend themselves in the village. Their commander is a brilliant general who has never lost. Even defensively, they can't win. The point is to pretend they can fight. Still, it's impossible to lead a large army through the forest. That's why Earl was sure that their numbers weren't high. Besides, ordinary soldiers can't move that fast. So they were his elite. In our cats, they were the best of the best. The hero assumed that the general would not want to lose such soldiers. In that case, we need to set terms that both sides can live with. Their goal is to survive, but the king's is different. Almas assumed that Earl wanted him to give up everyone but him, but he was scared and said that wasn't true. He knew perfectly well that even if they did, the king would kill everyone else anyway. His goal is to do this to give everyone a warning. More specifically, they need them to be dead on paper. That didn't mean he needed real death. Almas realized what he was talking about. In a nutshell, he needed confirmation that they had killed them. It's unrealistic for him to kill them all and drag the bodies back, as the corpses would rot halfway through. The king needs something that won't rot, proof. Perhaps he'll try to strip them of all their clothes as proof. Almas thought about it and said that in that case we should look for clothes for them. Taking off the pendant, Earl said that should be enough. It was a bronze ring. He said that in his country every child was made a big ring. When the ring fit on your finger, it meant you were an adult. Perhaps we could sell it. Now it's more valuable than any gemstone. The ring was engraved with the clan seal. All the villagers and towns had the same seal. They doubted that everything would go smoothly since it was the king. Meanwhile, the soldiers were discussing the fugitives. In the middle of the night, the army was resting by the fire. The fugitives annoyed them. It would be better for them if they organized a revolution. In that case, they wouldn't have to chase them. A soldier asked the king if he was going to kill them, and he agreed without thinking. He talked about how if they forgave them, people would follow their path. It was important to be cruel and yet careful. The king asked the soldiers not to worry, for he had already prepared for the invasion of King Rossix's territory. And then they would be able to satiate themselves with the looted food. Looking up at the sky, the king said that he knew how strong the king of Rosicrucian was. He asked himself, what kind of attitude is that? He remembered how happy he was when they became independent after he killed Lagos and became king. 
The soldier said it was all out of hatred for Ash's family since she had always been a slave to the Rossicks family. And not that he was always weak in battle, but he's still a brilliant commander. The king still wondered where the damn child had gone. His mistake was letting Ash's daughter escape. The soldier was sure the girl was dead, for a ten-year-old girl could not have survived in the forest. He assumed she had been eaten by wolves. One of the subjects said they found them. The people were a little to the south of them, but there seems to be a whole village there, and the dogs smelled them. The king was shocked when they told him about the village. He guessed it was the same village that was protected by the griffin. He thought it was all exaggerated by history. But is that a bad thing? And could they defeat the god? The king had heard that griffins don't interfere in human conflicts, plus the territory went further into the forest. He also said that he once got lost in this forest. Then he came face to face with a vulture. And he told him that his territory was deep in the forest, and he could do whatever he wanted as long as he was not in his territory. The soldiers were as surprised at their king as ever. In that case, they would pay the village a visit no matter what. As they approached the village at night, they noticed that the village was quite large. Judging from the size, there were a hundred people living there. There were ditches and fences to deter wolves, but no army. They noticed that someone was coming at them. It was the armed inhabitants. The soldiers offered to kill them, but the king said he didn't want to lose any men and told them to stop. One of the villagers stepped forward. It was Almus, who had a sword behind his back. He asked the king what had brought them here, but he demanded the lad introduce himself. Almus replied that he was the head of this village and said his name. The king said he had come to punish his men who had fled from his country and demanded that he give them up. Almus and the others could not allow them to be killed before their eyes and refused. The king asked to talk things over and asked the lad to come up. The soldiers were surprised, for the lad did indeed walk toward them. He was very brave. Almus thought that everything was going fine. The main thing was to stay calm and not to do anything unnecessary. Siona and Ruru looked at Almus in fright. Would ask the guys if they should have gotten closer, but Ron said they should trust Almus. In case anything happened, Graham, with bow in hand, knew his task. Tatra prayed to Almus that he wouldn't die. As he approached the king, the hero greeted him and asked if he could come closer. The king refused, and he bet the lad would not feel safe. The king was willing to listen to his reason why he could not fulfill his demand. The hero thought about the fact that he would at least be listened to. He said that there were many people living in his village. Then if they were going to kill them, he would like to leave them here. After all, there shouldn't be any problems here, and looked at the king. The king could not agree and leave the people unpunished. Here Almus agreed with him. He offered to pretend to punish them and let them live. And the proof that he had killed them all would be the ring. He took it out and showed it to the king. They would give back the rings that proved they belonged to them. The king offered to give not only the rings, but everything in their village, and looked at the puzzled soldiers. He promised to leave them clothes and lives. He thought it was a good deal for the people. Almus thought about how it was almost as Earl had said, who was sure that the king would want to maximize the benefits. The hero said that if they gave everything away they would starve to death, and asked if in that case they could keep half. But if they want to take it all, it would be bad. The guy raised his hand, which meant a gesture to fight. All the villagers prepared to fight, and Almus coldly told the king that they would burn the place to the ground. The king assumed that if they did that, everyone would die anyway, so the hero hoped he would do the right thing. The king didn't think that Almus would have the resolve to set the whole village on fire, so he thought about it anyway. He offered them 70%. Almus thought to himself that it was still a lot, but it was better than such an offer. Bowing down, the hero thanked the king and said they would give them 70% of the supplies. That was the end of the negotiations. When they left, the hero told the boys that he was glad they had gotten past the fighting. Tatra asked what they should do now. The boy said that he had to meet with the king of the wolverines and discuss what to do with the village and the people. Ron didn't really believe that the king would help. He hoped for a little help, because they were paying some taxes, and now they needed protection. Otherwise, they would be in trouble. Earl asked Almus if he was going to have an audience with the king, and asked him to keep him company as well. He thought it would be better if he explained everything to the king himself. 
Alma said he was staying, as he still doubted him. Tetra said she would go with him. Almas asked if she was sure, but the girl had already thought it over. The leader was counting on Ram. After getting on her horse, Thetra noticed that the sun had not risen yet, but Almas told her not to worry, because the sun would rise soon. On the way, she talked about how she kept running away. This was because she didn't want to ruin her life with everyone, and she was also afraid of the king. But there were people who still suffered, all because of him. She was the last one left of the Ash family, and had to take all the responsibility since she was born in that family. Almas looked at her sadly, and said that her life belonged to her alone. It's not about Earl and the others, such a thing as responsibility for a powerful family has nothing to do with it, and if she didn't want to do it, there was no need to force herself. The girl smiled, but being part of such an influential family, that was also her part of life. She didn't want to spend her whole life running away from the king. She should solve all the problems with him on her own. The hero smiled and said he had nothing to say. The hero saw the dawn and was happy to look at the sun. The girl turned to him and asked him to say one more thing. After she solved the problem with the king of Ferm, she asked the hero to marry her. The girl screamed each time repeating it louder and louder, making the guy fall into a stupor. Silently drove on, Almas thought that it was like a thunderbolt. The girl frowned at him and reminded him of what he had said about how important she was to him. But the only nuance here was that the same Ron and the others had said it even more often than he had. For starters, he'd offered to calm down and get off the horse, and then talk about it tomorrow. Tatra said he was the one who needed to calm down. After getting off her horse and standing in front of the hero, she proposed to him. Almas thought about how he looked at Tatra like a little sister. And not just because it was her, he similarly thought of the other children that way. He'd never thought of them as lovers. But if he had to reconsider that, he told the girl that if she married him, it meant that she had to live with him and she knew it. And she wouldn't be able to give it up so easily in the future. And getting married meant that they would have children in the future. He wanted to continue, but Tatra interrupted him and said she knew about everything. It made her nervous. She demanded that he answer her directly, yes or no, and asked if he loved her. Blushing, the hero answered yes. She asked him if she was a beautiful girl, and the guy said yes. Does he think she would be suitable for him as a wife? The guy again said yes. But when she asked if he would marry her, he said no. After all, as a man, he could not accept such an offer from her. Taking the girl's hands, he asked her if she would marry him. Tatra shining with joy jumped on the guy and they embraced each other. He asked her to hurry to the kingdom and she agreed with him. After all, they were still facing starvation. Turning to the horse, the hero thought it was tantamount to being handed a death flag in his hands. After listening to the lad, the king said that it must be hard. Almas agreed, for they had lost most of their food and advantages because of it. The king said he would give them food for at least a year. And in return, Almas had to take care of the refugees. The boy thanked the king. The king noticed that this sort of thing had already happened on the borders with the kingdom of Ferm. But he was glad they couldn't burn down their village. After all, he would not be able to collect taxes from dead people. The king noticing Tatra asked who was the young lady beside him. Tatra said that it was quite a long time ago, and coming closer, she said that it all happened ten years ago. When King Razik visited the Ash Mansion in the capital, she was by her father's side when she met him. The king grew dark and serious, stopping the guards that wanted to come running. He told the girl that if she lied, he would execute her. And if she did not answer his question, she would also be executed. He asked her what her father's name was. She answered that her father was the head of the Ash family, Lagos Ash, Karishian's mother. She apologized for her late introduction and said her name was Teethra Ash. The king put his palm to his face and said the gods had not yet left him. He asked if she could confirm her identity, and she said she had a coat of arms and offered to look at it. The king apologized for his rudeness in telling her to take off her clothes and show her the coat of arms. Lifting her clothes, she exposed the back of her body and showed the coat of arms. She asked if he had seen enough. And the king froze in place and apologized. He asked if she had a ring, and she showed the king his as well. The hero himself saw the ring for the first time and was surprised that Tatra hid it. It was made of gold, after all, so she buried it and hid it. She planned to sell it if they were on the edge of the abyss. 
Almas replied that he wasn't mad at her. The king asked to interrupt their argument and look at the ring. 